podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. This show originally aired on the Premier Networks on Saturday, July 31st, 2021. This is episode 1815. Enjoy. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Yes, time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography. We got your smartphones. We got your smart watches. We got uh, all that uh, that rigmarole that uh, is changing our world so rapidly around us. Technology. Woo. Te what a concept. Woo. <laughs> Technology. If you want to talk about technology, uh, you can gripe. You can you can be unhappy about it. That's okay. I can help you. Uh, I'm kind of a technology counselor. That's among my many jobs. A therapist, if you will, for people who are suffering with technology. 8888-ASK-LEO is my phone number. I'm here for you, baby. 8888-ASK-LEO. That's uh, toll-free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada. Outside that area, you could still call. Just use Skype and Skype out. Just call that phone number and you should be a free call to me. 888 Eight two seven five five three six. The website, uh, of course, I'm. It's a tech show. You should have a website. Everybody got a website these days. Actually, websites now are kind of old hat. Like, oh yeah, of course you got a website. But do you have a mobile app? No, no. I'm sorry. No. Do you have a TikTok? No. Hmm. Did you see? By the way, oh, I didn't mention the website. Let me do that, and then I will. <laughs> then I will digress. The website is techguylabs.com. Com. Techguylabs.com. Okay. That's free, by the way. I, I mentioned that not because uh, I want you to pay me or anything. There's no sign up. There's no charge. It's just there. It's a public service. And everything I say will be there. James DeRuvo's writing it down. Techguylabs.com. There's also audio and video from all the shows going back many a moon. This is episode 1815. Our 17th year uh, of tech guying. So I was going to digress. I just I just noted that uh, TikTok. No, I, I guess I do have a TikTok, but do I ever post to it? No. TikTok is, has had 3 billion downloads. How many people are in the U.S.? 350 million? How many people in the world? 7 billion? 3 billion downloads. Now, I mean, that's not 3 billion unique users because I know I've downloaded a few times myself, personally. You know, I do that with TikTok. I download it. I install it. I play with it. I wake up. I, you know, suddenly realize I've been TikToking for the last four and a half hours. The guy comes on and says, hey, you really, you need to go to bed. They're, they're, they're literally, if, you, if you're on it long enough... TikTok puts up a, a video that says, get a drink of water, take a walk. You know, you, you've been really on this for a long time. <laughs> when I see that guy, I go, oh, I better go to sleep. I got to work in the morning. When that happens a couple of times, I delete TikTok in a rage. No more TikTok for me. And then I reinstall it a month later. And then I, it's a rinse, lather, repeat kind of a thing. It's a love-hate relationship. So that's why 3 billion downloads. I bet you half those people have downloaded it, just like me, and deleted it, and downloaded it, and deleted it. Last week, I had a word of the week. I thought, I'm not going to do this every week. Don't worry. It's not a it's not a regular feature. But there is a word of the week this week, I thought, that is kind of new. It's angstrom. Yeah, angstrom. A-N-G-S-T-R-O-M. Swedish word. So the A has a little halo over it. And the O has an umlaut, so it's probably pronounced Angstrom. It's named after a guy, I'm sure. Uh, it is 100 millionth of a centimeter, 10 billionth of a meter. Why would we care about it? You know, you, you, it's such a tiny little thing. You measure the wavelength of light in angstroms. It's several hundred angstroms. Why would we, what would we care about angstroms for? Because... It's the new measure of processors you're going to hear about. 
I don't know if you've been following this at all. When we talk about the CPU, the microprocessor, actually GPU too, any of the processors in your computers or phones or tablets or you know uh, any you know microwave, they often talk about the size of the wires in that thing, which is really better represented by the number of transistors or the transistor density or something like that. But for some reason, we measure the size of the wires. And they've gotten smaller and smaller. Intel's microprocessors are 10 nanometers, 10 billionths of a meter. 10, is that right? Nano, billion. What are the, so the, uh, yeah, I have to remind myself of the international system of units. You, every time you've got a meter, which is about a yard, right? A centimeter, which is a hundredth of a meter. Uh, you know, in the other direction, kilometer is a thousand meters, right? So centimeters, a hundredth of a meter, millimeters, a hundredth of a centimeter or a thousandth of a meter. And it goes down from there. A nanometer is pretty small. <laughs> it's pretty, pretty, pretty small. It's so it's smaller, thinner than a hair. Yeah, no, it's super. It's super small. So um, whew, let's see. You got centi, milli, micrometer. Okay, that's a millionth of a meter. Nanometer which is a billionth or a millardeth of a meter. P Pico is the next one, but we're not going to use picometer. We're not going to use picometer in measuring these chips. So Intel's uh, 10 nanometers, some 14. A uh, ARM and some other processors are now getting smaller. TSMC is making uh, processors that are the equivalent of four nanometers in fact they just they're starting to build a plant for two nanometers well pretty soon you got you got to go to a new measurement because you got one one half one one nanometer what it, then what's next so what's next well it should be picometer but we're going to instead we're going to go to angstrom that's the word of the week angstrom so you're going to start seeing uh processors using a 20a and it'll be an a with a little halo over it 20 like the anaheim angels little a <laughs> oh and a little halo over it uh that is an angstrom <sighs> one ten billionth of a meter there you go that's the number one ten billionth of a meter so 20 angstroms is actually two nanometers and, but that way we can get down to 10 angstroms, 5 angstroms, 2 angstroms. I don't know what we're going to do after that. They get so small, pretty soon you're, I mean, you're well below, you're subatomic now. Angstroms measure the distance between atoms in material and things. I mean, it's tiny. Why is this important? Well, really, the, the really important measurement, which nobody uses, is density of transistors on these chips. The more transistors you can get on these chips, the more powerful they are. In fact, that's the very famous Moore's Law that was coined, you know, back in the, I don't know, 60s. Um, Moore, Gordon Moore was a um, engineer at uh, one of the early microprocessor companies and then later went to uh, Intel. He created up Moore's Law. He was the chairman and founder of uh, Intel. And Moore's Law for a long time, drove computers. It was actually the most important, probably the most important thing in technology, even though no one's ever heard of it. Well, geeks have. Moore's Law held that the number of transistors on a processor would double every every year and a half, every 18 months. And it held true for a long time. Now, if you double and double that and then double that and double that, that's big, right? That's a big growth. And in fact, the latest uh, M1 processor from Apple, which is pretty small <laughs> it's about the size of a i don't know your fingernail your pinky fingernail it has 16 billion with the b transistors on it that's roughly a measurement of its power you know the uh, uh the intel um let's see the first pc was built on an intel 8088 microprocessor and it's it's transistor count so remember, the uh, its transistor count was uh, 29,000 29, 
And so that's the point, is that this number has doubled every year and a half for the last 30 or 40 years. We're actually kind of at the end of Moore's Law. You can't keep doing that. But it's pretty impressive. You've got 16 billion. So we went from the earliest days of computing. The Macintosh, first Macintosh, had a processor with 68,000 transistors. So the first Mac had 68,000 transistors in its processor. The current Mac has... What did I say? I forgot already. <laughs> These numbers, 16 billion. That's a that's a big shift, isn't it? That's a lot. And, and that roughly equates to the power of the processor. So I just, the word of the week is angstrom because we're going to start hearing these 20A, they're talking about 20A processors. That's the equivalent of two nanometers. And that's the new, I'm just, I'm letting you know ahead of time, a word of warning. You can add that to your geek dictionary. Actually, we, you know, Intel kind of ran out of steam on this. And that's why they started, because the processors were getting so hot and the, you know, usually when you get it smaller, it's cooler, but Intel's just had trouble making those. So instead of uh, making them smaller, they just put more transistors in it, more uh, processors in a chip. So that's what we talk about, you know, four core and eight core and dual core processors. Because instead of just making them smaller and faster, they just put more of them on there, which is not quite the same. Not quite the same. I'm sorry I even, I'm sorry I even started. It's just, I, I find this, to me, Maybe that's why I'm in this business. I find that fascinating that you go from a chip with, you know, the first Mac with 68,000 processors to the current Mac or transistors in the processor, 68,000 transistors in the processor to the current Mac with a lot more. 60, what did I say? I keep forgetting. Huge. <laughs> it's just, it's mind boggling. <laughs> 16 billion transistors in the just mind-boggling 16 billion transistors in the chip your phone in your pocket if you have a late model iphone say you have an a14 in there the bionic 11.8 billion i mean you we're talking a lot of we're that's powerful stuff powerful powerful that's why yeah uh, computers are doing so much more than they used to. 8888-ASK-LEO. That's the phone number. 888-827-5536. Let's talk, you and me, let's talk high tech. We could talk about the angstroms if you want. Actually, that's not true. We will not call you. <laughs> no salesman will call. What's my number? 8888-ASK-LEO. When you call that number, you get this fabulous person, my phone angel, Kim Schaffer. Hi, sh hi, Kim. Hi. I have on occasion called people back. Do you really? I have. Oh, I if didn't even know. If somebody's been on the phone for like an hour and a yeah, half or two fair. hours. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> I'll say, I'll call you back the next yeah, day. I yeah. tell them to call back. I but... apologize. Yeah. <laughs> it's me. Tell them. Leo's a gas bag. He's a windbag. He won't stop talking. I'm sorry. He's never going to get to you. <laughs> I'm I use sorry. nicer terms than that. <laughs> you can, no, I give you permission. They say he's chatty Kathy. <laughs> chatty Kathy? I'd rather be a windbag. <laughs> Hi, I'm Chatty Kathy. Pull my string, see what he say. I think so, I had one of those. <laughs> who should I who should I talk to first? Uh let's go to Adam in Burbank, who's got an uh he's not trusting his Android and the messages that are popping up on I the am, screen. I am I completely uh, understand. Yeah. I do. <laughs> Thank you, Kim. Hi, Adam. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Well, hi, Leo. And I was just uh, very entertained by the stuff you put on hold. Uh, <laughs> don't give up your day, day job for a singing career. I was singing David Bowie because I found out I can finally name my, uh, my Amazon Echo uh, Ziggy. Ziggy played guitar. Anyway. Oh, you're right. I'm not a good singer. What can I do for you? And, well, anyway, just, uh, just as a comment, my first computer was a Cosmac Super Elf. I never heard of that. What is that? Two Cosmac Super Elf. It was a kit computer back when the only computer magazine was Popular Electronics. Oh, yeah. It came in a wooden box, and you had to put it together, and it had a grand total of 256 
bytes of memory. Wow. <laughs> you had wow. to enter Google Cosmac Super L. So I'm a, I'm a, I'm a legitimate graybeard. Yes, you are. You <laughs> count. Like, you are absolutely, yeah. What can I do for you? I mean, it was it was the next generation ab above the one that you had to enter everything in binary. Yeah. It had an RCA anyway, one, 1802 microprocessor. I'm going to have to look that one up, find out how many transistors I, I were in that. TRS-80, TRS-80, yeah. and all that. The good old days. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But uh, uh, this newfangled technology has got this gray beard befuddled. Uh-oh, what's the newfangled stuff? Well, my, my Android phone, which I love, keeps periodically every two or three days, uh, I get a message from Google, urgent account information needed, your birthday. So given the security... I would ignore you know, that, yes. What, or should do, I just lie? <laughs> what is the link uh, that it sends you to? Is it a, a legit Google link? Pretty sure, but I, I that's something I didn't think about. So I would but check that. Sure. Although why they want your birthday, I don't know. Except that may you know often um, when you're identifying yourself, all you need is you know the last four of your social and your birthday or something like that. So I'd be you're right not to give out your real birthday. That's absolutely correct. But I would even be and, suspicious and of that text message, especially because you keep getting it. But I don't. But here's here's the thing. I mean. Um, I don't go to weird websites in 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 countries with that we can't extradite from or anything. <laughs> That's a, probably a wise policy. <laughs> Check the extradition not, policy not, first. Not, not surfing <laughs> the weird adult sites. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so you think I should check to make sure there's? But I go through all the apps. In the in the in you know the apps the thing and the thing all the apps and anything if I don't recognize it away it goes. Good, right? yeah. Only install stuff that you really know what it is. So Google yeah. might indeed ask for your birthday, um, but it shouldn't do it over and over again unless maybe because you're giving it. So um, when so so Google says when when you sign up for an account. Uh, we ask you for your birthday. Knowing your birthday helps us use age-appropriate settings. You know, mostly what they're worried about is the Child uh, D uh, Online Decency Act, which says that people under 13 can't be tracked. So it's possible Google's trying to verify you're not under 13. Um, so I wouldn't worry about it, though. I think you can just enter any date as long as it's over 13 years old. I shouldn't keep asking you. That does make me nervous. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. I'll get back. To had, to, had to take a little break on that. Yeah, I would. So, is it? It's a text message you're getting. Yeah, it's like a notification. Oh, it's not a text anything. message. Okay. See, so if a text message, I would say it's certainly not true. But if it's a note, if it's a pop up, a notification, uh, probably yeah. when you click on that, it is taking you back to uh, either a setting in Android or your Google account online. Uh, and just, just lie and forget about it. Or, yeah, apparently it doesn't. It doesn't. First of all, make sure it's not. It's not some kind of mal thing or. Well, I mean, I, yeah. Even then, yeah. I mean, that's only. That's not enough by itself to do anything. Uh, you know, but I could see. Um, I think if you if you go in, I'm okay. I'm looking at a piece from Tom's Guide. Uh, you shouldn't share your birthday online. You're absolutely right about that well, yeah yeah no 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 with no. your name address right. date of birth and social you anybody could be you and sometimes it's just the last four right. digits and why give them one more piece of why, exactly them right um i see that well google does know your birthday and they and they say we have to know your birthday for this you know child decency act um I, but, uh, I've been, I've been dismissing this notification for months and now yeah. it's just getting tiresome. Yeah. Uh, I think it's okay. It's the child online privacy protection act, COPPA. And I, so I'm just, so just, just lie, to just me. lie. As long as it's over 13, give them a roughly of the right age, I guess. Uh, well, I'm 61 years old. So oh, I'm you're just a kid. Work. You're a whippersnapper. Uh, I'm just a kid that has a computer <laughs> with 256 bytes of memory. Thanks, Leo. You, know, you want to know what the transistor count was on that RCA uh, 1802? 
Remember, maybe I don't remember the. It was five thousand. It was. Yeah, no, that I did. I already did, and it's a five thousand transistors compared to the sixteen billion in a modern iMac. <laughs> well, Moore was right, wasn't he? Yeah, it's pretty impressive, isn't it? It's and, really. And I'm about. I'm about to build a new computer with the latest Ryzen, and uh, you know, because I do, I do uh, CGI and stuff like that. Oh, cool. And. Yeah, yeah. So, but I think the other question is the M1 is it, it doesn't have multiple processors or threads. No, it well, yes, it does. It's an octa core, so it has eight cores, but they do it like they do it on the iPhone. Where there's four high efficiency cores for low power use. There's four high mm -hmm. performance cores for high performance use. So it is multi-threaded. Um, so for uh, content creation, I, I made the right choice with the Ryzen. Don't the, you think? I think so. I use a Ryzen for gaming. Uh, I think the M1 has a great future, but the problem is compatibility. It's not an x86 architecture, so software uh, has to I be run, rewritten. Uh, I run like you know Adobe Creative Suite, and uh, here's the good news: almost if you're on a Mac, almost all Adobe Creative Suite has been updated to M1 uh, native. But I think so a good fast Ryzen that, that the M1 is faster than my Ryzen. In some 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 circumstances, yeah, not always though. You're right. And like I said, yeah. I bought a, a, a 5800 uh, or 3800 for, sorry, 3800 for my gaming machine. So, well, like I said, I'm a homebrew guy, and that's fine. You know, it, a Ryzen it's 9 3900 has 9.8 billion transistors, so it has fewer. Well, but it's I got the 3500, so I'm second class citizen. Oh, what are you crazy? You're nuts. I would say the M1 might actually perform better than that, but I I wouldn't tell you that. What's the G, the more important thing for you is the GPU. What'd you get for a GPU? Well, 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 I'm not a gamer. I, I'm in, and so what I bought was a um. um a uh, compatible thing that will accelerate things like um, so. Um, so Photoshop uses it. A number of process, a number of Adobe products will use the GPU. In fact, will yeah. offload the processor, and it, that's where it, actually it, you'll have an advantage because the GPU on the uh, M1 is built in. They don't support third-party GPUs. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. It's so, you know what? You know. They're so fast. All of them now, Adam. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. If you're happy, well, I'm happy. I'm about ready to put the computer together, but I didn't realize that with the new liquid cooled system, you have to try it first. Yeah, that's pretty amazing because uh, California won't let you have it. Hey, I got to run. He is our favorite home theater guru, Scott Wilkinson, home theater geek, contributor at techhive.com, and a regular weekly visitor to our show. Hello, Scott. Hey, Leo. Always happy to be here. Great to see you. What's up in the uh, home theater world? Oh, well, I wanted to uh, hip you to uh, a new article that I just uh, posted last week on Projector Central. Tech Hive is my main home, but I also write elsewhere, and Projector Central is one of them. Okay. What would you write about? So I wrote about HDR, high dynamic range, yeah. on projectors. Now, projectors, uh, on, on a flat panel TV, like an OLED or an LCD, high dynamic range is pretty easy because they can get very bright and they can get really dark. Right. So the difference between them is great, and so you have high dynamic range. Right. On a projector, it's much more difficult because they don't get that bright. We actually were talking about this on the show last week about projectors there're not many 4K projectors and I didn't even know there were any Actually there are quite a quite a few but they're expensive 4K. now right Well no, no. Uh, and in terms of 4K projectors uh Texas Instruments uh well a lot of So they now are, have a 4K DLP out there is that Well it? sort of it's this is very interesting actually it's a I'm sorry I distracted you go ahead it, <laughs> It's a DLP chip Yeah and it basically reproduces a quarter of a 4k display at a time and it it zooms around and just uh, basically it's it's interleaved in a sense uh it it displays so, this so this quarter quadrant and then this quadrant and then this quadrant that's kind of what quadrant. i was saying is it's it's faux k it's what we call faux K. Yeah, yes, exactly yeah. right. Now, HDR, now, I didn't even realize that they, they were even close because, as you point out, projectors just are not as bright as direct view monitors. Not by any means. They, you know, you're lucky if you can get 100 nits 
uh, out of a on a, off of a screen from a projector. Uh, LCD TVs are easily a thousand nits, right. so ten times as bright. Right. O OLEDs are getting there to, to roughly that same level as well these days. So projectors are are a tenth of that brightness. Well, what and do we do, Scott? What will we do? <laughs> what do we do? <laughs> well, that's what this article is all about. It's about optimizing your projector for HDR because a lot of projectors now do offer the ability to accept an HDR signal. Yes. And when they accept the HDR signal, what do they do with it? <laughs> because the HDR signal uh, the HDR content was mastered at uh, Sony or Disney or one of the studios uh, at 1,000 nits or 2,000 nits or even 4,000 nits. And so what, what do you nits do? Nits are a me measure of brightness. I measure of brightness, yeah. yes. Thank you. Um, and so what do you do when, you're, when your display can only do 100 nits? Well, you have to make some decisions about how you're going to roll off the bright the bright end of the spectrum because you're going to have to roll it off pretty severely. You're going to have to limit it because it can't get anywhere near a thousand nits. Yeah. So you either roll it off so that the bright parts still have detail in them. But then when you look at the most of the image, which is not near that top end, it's going to look very dim. Or you can set it so that your, your dim parts look good but then your bright parts get get what's called clipped uh, and they look very flat and and not very interesting now so is this that, now going to be faux hdr just like it's faux k <laughs> you know i hadn't i had never thought of that one before but it's actually a good way to look at it it's it's, it's simulating it it's sort of simulating HDR. But what does it correct. look like to your eye? Does it really look like you're, there's some... Well, it depends on how you optimize the projector. And in this article, I go into not only optimizing the projector itself, but the room yeah. that you're in. The which darker is very the room, important. the better, right? Correct. Correct. Absolutely. Because really, HDR is the difference between the darkest and the brightest. So. Correct. And so the dark, the darker the room, that's like having in audio. It's like having a very low noise yeah. floor, yeah. right? Yeah. So the the lower the noise floor, the more dynamic range you have in audio. The darker the room, the more dynamic range you have in video. So you optimize your room. You optimize your screen. You have to think about what kind of screen you're going to get. And then you need to think about optimizing the user controls. And finally, the last step is calling in a calibrator and having them do the calibration. And I actually, this article is basically an interview with three different very highly regarded calibrators, ah. uh, one in California, one in uh, Seattle, and one in New York. And uh, they talk about the fact that this is not easy. HDR on a projector is very, very difficult. Um, so for example, what most of them recommend that when you're calibrating the projector, you, when you calibrate for SDR, standard dynamic range, you set the peak level, the peak brightness level to about 50 nits. And then the HDR can go up to 100 nits. And that gives you a greater sense of pop of, uh, you can see the difference. It's not going to hurt your eyes, but at least, no, you'll, no. <laughs> at least you'll see a difference. Yeah. That's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Um, and uh, so there, there are many things you can do to, to optimize. But you're right. It is kind of faux HDR. It's not real HDR in that, as I said before, the content was created with a peak brightness of like a thousand nits or more. Uh, you're, you're familiar with the movie The Meg? It was a recent movie that. <laughs> See, this know, is the thing I enjoy about you, uh, and and people like you. You look at a movie not for whether it's a good movie, The Meg, <laughs> not a, you know a list film, but no. but you're looking at it for its. Technical merits. Technical, yes, yes. And in that way, I'm a videophile, like audiophiles. And I was just talking about this the other day, that audiophiles very often will, will oh, this piece of music is great for, 
Yeah, because it's got range. cannons or bells. Or, yes, yeah. yes. Is mm-hmm. it, yeah, but is it a good piece of music? No, well, it's a terrible no. song. <laughs> so the Meg, does the Meg have a lot of HDR footage it's, in it? It was mastered at 4,000 nits. Wow. It was mastered. It's and about it's not, a giant shark underwater. It's about a I giant remember. shark. Yeah. And I will I will tell you, as, a, as an aside, I'm actually on the soundtrack of that movie. <laughs> Do you play the, what do you play, I, the whale sounds? What do you? The, I play the conch shell trumpet. <laughs> you, you've seen pictures of the South Sea yeah, Islanders yeah, yeah, blowing yeah, the conch shell yeah, trumpet. Yeah. Well, I'm a conch shell trumpet specialist. <laughs> Somebody's got to do it. It's like a shofar. If you can like play a, a ram's horn, you can play a conch. Or a vuvuzela. Or a vuvuzela. Exactly. Yes. So it's just blowing I'm, air I, through a thing. That's right. So I'm list I'm listed in the union as playing conch shell trumpet. Wow. So I got a call from the composer saying I need conch shell trumpet on my soundtrack on my nice. score for the Meg. So I'm actually there. I now the want to watch the Meg. <laughs> but the reason people got projection screens, the reason I have a projector, I have one of those high sense short throws. Right. Is because of the size of the screen. It's over a hundred right. it's a hundred inches. Exactly. Exactly. And so that's great for a big living room. A lot of people can see it or right. a, a but home theater. if you're in a big living room with a lot of lights yeah, on and you're having a party, it. you're not gonna see HDR anyway. anyway. You're not gonna see yeah. the value of it. You really need a dark room. You need the right screen and you need to optimize the controls in the projector to get the best possible HDR image that you can get. It's not going to be as good as a flat panel. You have if to you went out and it. got a Runco $30,000 laser projector, <laughs> would it be able to, the, the kinds they use in movie theaters, would it would it be HDR? Nope. No? Well, yes, it, it would be HDR, but a Dolby Cinema projector achieves 108 nits on the screen. Still not that bright. That's why your movie theater is dark. That's right. And it hurts when they turn on the lights. No. Scott Wilkinson <laughs> catches a article at projectorcentral.com. Very interesting. Very interesting. You know, I had never thought about calling it faux HDR before, but... Kind of actually, is. That kind of is. Yeah. That's, That's exactly fine. I didn't right. get a projector because I wanted the best picture. If I want the best picture, I go in the bedroom and watch the uh, LG OLED. Yeah. And it's a big difference. Oh, yeah. But but honestly, so we're watching Yellowstone, great TV show. It's mm. It probably isn't in HDR, but uh, let's see what it is. Something Might anyway. Be. some Something that's in HDR. Lots of HDR shows these days. 4K yeah, HDR. Are. So, yeah. yes, I can see the difference. But honestly, sometimes it's we want to watch in the living room because it's a big screen. It's more of a movie theater experience. So exactly I don't right. And it's exactly interesting. Right. Movie theaters aren't that bright either. That's right. Even Dolby Cinema. I mean, a normal, a conventional movie theater, uh, you're talking about, uh, I think, 48 nits. That's amazing. Is, is so this brightness? guy called me and said, how, you know, how bright can a projector go? And I said, well, you don't have to. That's you. Re that's the wrong question, really. You're not you're not. That's, you know, so that's. He was saying it depends not, on a lot of factors. Yeah, yeah. Including yeah. It depends the screen, on the screen. Yeah, the size of the how screen, how much the screen's and the, reflecting, and, the screen. and how far away yeah. from the screen, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Size of the screen. And projectors yeah, exactly. just aren't as bright as direct. That, not nearly. No. Even a laser projector. Um, laser's better though, right? I did. I yeah, did. Oh yeah. I did say get the laser. Yeah. 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 yeah that's true. Yeah. Um, now, J you, going back to your question or your comment about 4K. JVC and Sony both offer native 4K So images. they're starting to come out now. That's good. Oh, yeah. yeah. They've been out for... Uh, Sony's been out for quite a number of years. Oh, okay. And JVC is now starting to do that as well. So, so there are native 4K. But these DLP faux K uh, are actually pretty good because, you know, your eye, our human yeah. vision, vision system... Isn't that fast? You're far it's, away because it's such a big screen, right? And it's these fine. And, and it's going so quickly that it all fuses together yeah. into a beautiful picture. Yeah. Now, unfortunately, DLP has tr traditionally has very poor black levels, very high black levels. So it's not a a deep rich pic deep rich black, which is you really want that. That's JVC the biggest is, difference. JVC is the king of black levels. Yeah. I almost yeah. said, really, it's not HDR. It's not 4K. It's just the difference between a direct view screen and a projector is just, Correct. you know, that's that's noticeable. Yeah. And no, again, seriously noticeable. Yeah. And time. again, I don't mind. I'm fine.
Right. Because the advantage, as you say, is so important of a hundred inch screen or more. Uh, you know, you try to buy a hundred inch flat panel, it's going to cost you a lot of money. Although that's going to change too with micro it LED is. and so yep, forth. I think is. we're going to be able to mm -hmm. get pretty big. I figured, yep. in fact, I told Lisa that I said, we're going to keep the high sense until uh, a reasonably priced micro LED comes out. And then we'll, right. when we can get a hundred inch micro LED, we'll, for something we can afford, then we'll replace right. it. And that might be, right. it might only be five years out. It might not be. It that might, long. it might, five yeah. years. I just saw an article just the other day about um, uh, micro LED kind of ramping up in scale. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to stick around for the top of the hour? Happy to do it. All right. I got a little a little more time if you want to. Oh, by the way, uh, next next week I'll have something to say about angstroms. Oh, you heard me talking about that. The I word did. of the week, angstrom. The word of the week, angstrom. Angstrom. And 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 I actually have some uh, headphone news that I can't tell you now, uh, but I will after Monday. And uh, so next week I I can tell you about Good. it. And it has to do with angstroms. Did you ever put out an, your review of the Oda? <laughs> I did not yet because they have not yet responded Boy, the to the music uh, on it is terrible. I I deeply you regret it. You tried it. it. Oh mm. god. I mean, they're not great speakers, but even then, I mean, Terry Riley humming and ja I just it's not good. Yeah. So, I'm going to cancel. Yeah. Anyway, stick around. This is the song written for my new Amazon Echo. <laughs> <laughs> because his new uh, wake word is Ziggy. And this is Ziggy Stardust. I don't think we're going to get to the lyrics. Are we? Yeah, here we go. Now, if that woke up your Amazon Echo, I apologize. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888-ASK-LEO, the phone number. Laura on the line from uh, Goldendale, Washington. Hi, Laura. Hello. Hi. Thank you for taking my call. Thanks for I calling. Um, found your description of Angstrom very interesting, but my question is more befuddling than that. Oh, and, wow. <laughs> and more basic. Befuddling and basic. Yeah. Um, I have a 17 by 20 living room, and I have a 10-year-old Panasonic TV that I want to replace. Now, my husband was a techie guy, and he hooked it all up to four um, clip speakers. Oh, nice. And um, a fifth, whatever that big one is. Yeah, the subwoofer. So it's, yeah. that's the thing that goes boom, boom, the low end. And then he used an Onkyo, what do you call that thing, receiver? Basically. Yep, yep, receiver, yep. Okay, so I want to replace the TV now. It needs to be replaced. And I'm looking at a Samsung, the QN65Q. Oh, the new, is that the new QNED, Scott? Is that what that is? I think it is. The Q, the new uh, LED technology. Uh, it might be. I have to look that the up. The QN. Yeah. Uh, well, QN is, a, is probably a QLED of some sort. Yeah. yeah. So... What's so my question is kind of a two-part question is, if not this, then that. Um, so are my speakers going to be plug and play to that? Because yes. Because I'm not going to figure it out. Yes. Oh, thank you. So, well, it depends on how your husband wired it. But most likely what he did is your cable box, your DVD player, whatever sources you have uh -huh. are going into that Onkyo receiver. And then the Onkyo has an HDMI cable coming out of it that goes into your Panasonic. Yes. Uh, How much I know. <laughs> yes. Well, all you'll do is you'll take the Panasonic out, put in the Samsung, plug in that HDMI cable, and you're going to want to plug it into the one that has ARC labeled on it, which one of one of those ports will. That's the uh, the return audio return channel, and then it should just work. Absolutely the same way. That's assuming that the Panasonic uses HDMI. Ten years old probably does. Do you know? Um, yeah, but one of the reasons I need to replace it is um, it's old enough that I can't get any of the Internet programming through it or streaming anymore. Yeah, yeah. Your new Samsung will work just fine on that. Okay. Yeah. Oh, good. So as long as you're using HDMI, which you probably are, there are other ways, in other words, to connect that receiver to your TV. 
that might be different. But if it's using an HDMI cable coming from the Onkyo into the TV, all yeah. you do is you swap TVs and it'll all work exactly the same. Oh, wow. That just made it easy. So so that receiver is still going to be good. It's not too old or incompatible or anything well, like that. I don't know how old it is, but... Uh, Same age. It's a TX608. 608. So it doesn't do 4K. So your new TV supports 4K, which looks great. But do you... So the And, and if anything you watch on the TV using the smart TV, which it sounds like you're doing like your Netflix or whatever, that'll be fine. Because the Onkyo is just taking the sound. It's not doing anything with the video. Do you have any devices going into the Onkyo, like a Roku or an Apple TV or a DVD player, anything like that? DVD player. Okay. That doesn't do 4K yet either. So if at some point you said, I want to watch these new high, you know, high fidelity UHD Blu-rays, you'd have to get a new player. And then it would be incompatible with the Panasonic. You wouldn't be able to see 4K through the Panasonic. But that's down the road. This is the problem with uh, sometimes when you go to 4K, there's this, I call it the upgrade cascade. Because not only now do you, okay, you got a TV that looks great, but everything going into it's got to be 4K too. But you get around that by using the TV for your 4K streaming. I take it that's what you do. How about, how? what other sources go into the Onkyo? Is there a cable box? Yes, it's yeah. a satellite, satellite. Yeah, so that's not 4K. So you're good. Okay. You're good. So it's a Samsung that I'm looking at, and um, my Blu-ray player is... It, I can't see it. It's HD. It's not a UHD player. So I'm not streaming anything now because the Panasonic's not accepting it. So I'm just getting regular satellite TV, period. From your TV, you're saying? Right. That's all I watch. Yeah. Because so you have a smart. In a way saying, well, you have a smart. TV's not supporting this anymore. Your TV's not supporting this anymore. Oh. So they're all gone now. Yeah, you know that's one thing I don't like about smart TVs. It sounds like I don't know pa about this Panasonic Scott, but it sounds like uh, they stopped updating it. Ten years old. It's not smart. Yeah. It's getting dumb. Well, <laughs> it's getting dumb, right? The other question I have though is, does the Onkyo receiver have ARC? Um. That that's because if it doesn't, it's 10 years old. It, it might or might not. I don't well, know when. Somehow she's getting it to work with the Panasonic. Yeah, the Panasonic doesn't have ARC, probably. Oh, it so doesn't. maybe she, there's a. You think there's an optical cable connecting the two? There may be. I don't know. There's an optical cable for something. Okay. Okay. That makes that's, sense. Yeah. So there, that's coming out of your TV and going into the Onkyo. But. So you need to make sure that the Samsung supports optical out. Which they it probably does. Almost A lot of TVs do, although lately I've been hearing some TVs don't. Hmm. So let's see. HDMI. I'm looking at what the uh, uh, specs are on the, um, on the now, Onkyo 608, the STX SRS 608. I think you're going to be fine. Okay. Um, what you want to essentially do is duplicate the setup so whatever's going into the Panasonic right now, you know, hold those wires in your hand. <laughs> You're going to have somebody install this, right? Oh, there's there's a mess of wires behind the console. Yes. Is somebody going to oh, come in and install the TV? The, yeah. Is it going to come? Somebody going to come and install this for you? No, I, I'm too far out in the country. They won't do so it. So you're going to have to lift this old TV off. What do you got? to I'll get someone to help me lift it off. Okay. But, yeah. The so, wires. So I've, what you want to look at. There will be probably three different wires going into the TV. A plug, obviously, power. You're going to take that out because you're going to use the Samsung. There'll be a HDMI coming from the Onkyo. That's just video. And then there's probably going to be a skinny little optical cable going into the TV. That goes back to the Onkyo. That's the audio. That needs to go in the back of your TV as well so that your TV can feed the audio back to the Onkyo so it can play it through the speakers. Okay, thank you. So if all of that doesn't work, is there a sound bar that would be... It will work the same way. Mm -hmm. It'll you Keep what you've got. You've got great speakers. You've got a mm -hmm. great setup. It's working well for you. Yep. There's no reason to downgrade to a sound bar. It won't be... It actually will not be simpler. Oh. It'll be the same. 
Okay. So essentially what you have to figure out is how is audio getting to the Onkyo, and you have to duplicate that. From my, the TV. From the TV. Yeah. And my guess it's coming from the optical cable. Because you're going to watch all your streaming stuff through the TV, I take it. Yes. Yeah. So that's good because that make, that really simplifies it. So yeah. your TV is going to display 4K because it's going to get 4K from, let's say, Netflix. And then, uh, so it's going to display it just fine. Your Ankyo will, won't know what to do with that video, but it doesn't have to see the video. It will only be seeing the audio, and that you'll get from an optical out on your TV. I would verify that that particular Samsung has optical out. I'm sure it does, but just make sure. I made a note. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you, it. You got the A team on this one. Scott's here to help. Thank you, Scott. It's our yeah. bet. My pleasure. Our pleasure, Laura. Thanks. Thanks for the call. And you know what? If it doesn't work, call me back. I promise you, we can get it working. Oh, good. Okay. Thank you. I'm your I'm your consultant here. I might even call you back if it does work. To thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. That's always thank yous are always welcome. And thank you, Scott. I appreciate it. You bet. La, 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 la. All yours, Scott, for the next eight minutes and 40 seconds. No, I thank you so very much. Yeah, I think that's going to be pretty straightforward for her. I do, too. My uh, The one concern that I didn't mention, and uh, uh, Out of Sync mentions it in the chat room, uh, optical should be a pass-through from HDMI, but some set TVs downsample it to PCM. That's not exactly downsampling, but what they do sometimes do is is only output stereo, which only is fine. Left and right. Uh, well, I guess that Onkyo must have decoding, or he. She said he hooked up four speakers. I don't know. He hooked. She hooked. He hooked up four speakers. Yeah. So that's so, a two point one, or no, three point one. Four. It's a four point one. Four speakers he, plus a sub. Right. So left, right, center. What's the fourth? Well, I I would guess it would be left, right, front, left, right, surround. No center or what's oh, no center phantom channel. Center. Uh, what's called a phantom center. Okay. Well, I don't want to get into that because she, I would guess she should I'd, get the center, but that's all right. I'd, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And the subwoofer. But if the TV's optical is only sending back to channel, which it could. But this is a I brand don't... new Samsung. Why would it do anything but send well, back Dolby? Uh, no, no. It's it's see, these TV manufacturers are nuts. They so a brand do. new TV might only send stereo might. back. It, it might. I don't know. I'd have to know the exact model. I th I'd be shocked. Well, she said it. Uh, I'd be shocked only because all these sound bars now are surround, simulated surround. Correct. And they all want a Dolby signal. Correct. So you'd be really shooting yourself in the foot, Samsung. If, if, you, if you didn't, if yeah, you didn't if you support didn't that. Send that. Yeah, yeah. I agree. I think I she's agree. still there. What, Laura, what's the model of TV you're getting? Um. You know, I do have a center speaker. Oh, you do? Good. Ah. Yeah, I just totally forget about it. But yes, there is one. So right it's 5.1. Yeah, so yeah. it is 5.1. Yeah. yeah. Well, and yeah. the other speakers are on stands. Yeah, they're nice clips. You, they, you've got a great setup. Your husband must have been an audiophile. He was techie as... Yeah. Techie my wife, my wife says you can't go anywhere because I will not be able to turn on the TV. <laughs> so I, I hope he left you some instructions. <laughs> so Laura, Laura, what what exactly is the model of TV you're getting? A Samsung QN65. I was something? looking at the QN the QN65Q90T. Ooh, very nice. Yeah, that's really very nice. nice. That's a very nice 4K smart TV. Yeah. I can't. Well, I'm going to look at the specs, but I couldn't. I, it's got to have. It's their. It's their best 4K. It is. Yeah. Full array, 16x uh, local dimming. I mean, it's yep. really nice. That's. It is really nice. Really nice. Um, let me just see if I can find. I'm looking on the spec page right now. See if I can find out what the optical out is. I'd be shocked if that didn't. It says TV yeah. and soundbar orchestrated in perfect harmony. Yeah, that's with with a Samsung soundbar. Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> you could always you could always if it didn't work get a Samsung soundbar, but I don't think you I don't think no. you're going to have any trouble. And you really your speakers are so good, Laura, that you want to keep that set up. That's a nice. You're going to have a hell of a home theater actually. It's true. I might be coming over. <laughs> um I'm just trying to see what the optical uh there's specs. There it's very um minimal 
information. Yeah, their their spec page is not very good. Yeah, I I would doubt that it gives you what type of output. It does there. say Dolby Audio. Yes. <laughs> yeah, but does, does, is but, that from the optical? Yeah, output? what's that coming off of? Yeah, exactly. Four uh, well, HDMI I, can it supports I, Atmos. I, when I changed out my TV console and I had to unplug everything, it was like this. It was nutty. And so it was I was techno plugging everything spaghetti. back. I do remember an optical cable. And um, I also remember he says, don't touch it, don't touch it because it's <laughs> fragile. And he had me under, we, ha we put in at the other end of the living room where the couches are, he put in a floor um, thing for the optical and for the HDMI or something to plug in so he could work on his computer on the TV. Oh, wow. Oh, that's really nice. He was a I geek. <laughs> Serious wires under the house across the back. Holy cow! Living room. Wow! Wow! Optical, don't wreck the optical. That's why I know there has to be one. <laughs> well, the 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 TV certainly has a digital optical output, so okay. so you're good there. Yeah, it says digital audio out optical. So mm -hmm. uh, just it unfortunately doesn't. It also has ARC, obviously. It doesn't. Right, but that's make only it, by HDMI. Yeah, by HDMI. So I. Yeah, I mean, there'll be a solution one way or the other, but almost certainly you're going to be able to plug that optical cable into the um, in the Onkyo because it was already in there, I think, right. I suspect. So really what you're looking at is just is just taking the cables that, that you disconnect from the TV and putting it in the new TV. And I think you might have to go into the menu settings. In fact, I know you will and change the audio so that it's going out the optical on the TV, the new TV. Right. That'll be the, my... Uh, the the Onkyo receiver is the TX NR605, did you say? Yes, um, that's what she said. Yeah. Wait a minute, I have it written down. Or SR, probably SR. Um, TX SR608. Oh, 608, okay. Um, I'm just, I just want to look and see if it has... Loqu Loquacious also says, Laura... Take your camera phone and take a picture of everything as you're disconnecting it. <laughs> oh, that's a great idea. Low question. Just in case. It's always a good, good idea. Good, good, good. Yeah. Right. Okay. I've had to do that in the workshop. That's a good one to do here. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Loquacious. Yeah. She's great. Yeah, um, Loquacious is great. I'm looking at the Onkyo owner's manual here. And let's see here. Um, I'm, I'm hoping to find a, a picture of the back. Here it is. Um, I don't, I, I'm not, I'm looking for now. I need to look for ARC and see if I can find it. Oh, look, it does have HD ARC. Good. Oh, so you'll, man. So you'll have a couple of options that yeah. you could use. Okay. Um, in fact, it probably will mean you can eliminate the optical cable entirely and ah. just have that ARC coming out of the TV. You'll need to plug it into the, the HDMI port that's labeled ARC, and that will send audio to the uh, Onkyo, and that's going to be easier anyway. That'll be simpler. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. It may be that Panasonic didn't have ARC, but uh, your new TV does. Thank yep. you. So that's even simpler. Mm-hmm. It's simple. Thank you yeah. so much. Yeah. You're so welcome, Laura. Oh, yeah. yeah. This, is, this, this is great. Now. Go shopping. That's a great TV. Scott and I agree. Nice 65 thou, incher. Yep. Go thou shopping. <laughs> go, right. go, you. go as thou and go shop thou. no more. <laughs> 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 Yeah, I actually recently uh, brought out the Dymo Labeler. Not Dymo, I have a brother Labeler. Labeled all my I, cables. I do too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Scott, thank you so much, my friend. Have a wonderful my week. Pleasure. I appreciate your helping Laura. You bet. All right, take care. See you next week. Bye-bye. Why, hey, hey, how are you today, Leo Laporte? The tech guy... 
Hour two of the Tech Guy Show, 8888 Ask Leo, the phone number. If you want to talk high tech, you can see we give you very personalized concierge service here. That is my motto. 8888 Ask Leo. If you, uh, if you hear something and you want to say, I want to write that down or I want to know more, it's all up on the website, techguylabs.com. That's free. No sign up, no charge. Uh, techguylabs.com. Do you see that uh, Scarlett Johansson, well... Her people are suing Disney uh, over the latest movie because, and this is, by the way, will not be the last time you hear about these lawsuits. Uh, others, in fact, I, I heard that um, the star of Cruella is, uh, I always want to call her Emma Peel, is, uh, is, a, is thinking about it too. Here's what's happening. And we knew this would happen. We knew it would happen with Warner Media when they announced that in addition to showing their movies in a movie theater because of COVID, they were going to stream them on HBO Max. And of course, Disney's doing the same thing. And they did that with Black Widow. They streamed it on HBO Max. But the thing you have to understand about these big stars is their contracts give them a cut of ticket sales. In fact, Johansson's lawyers say... Her compensation was based largely on box office receipts. Well, there's no box office receipts if you release a movie on TV or they're perhaps are greatly reduced. That's going to be the question is, what would the receipts have been if they had not released it on TV? To maximize these receipts in this says in this complaint, Mrs. Johansson enacted a promise from, extracted a promise from Marvel that the release of the picture would be a theatrical release. Now, it was released to theaters, but it was also released to TV. And the complaint goes on to say, as Ms. Johansson, Disney, Marvel, and almost everyone else in Hollywood knows, a theatrical release is a release that is exclusive to movie theaters. But now they have these day and date releases where the same day it goes in the theaters, a movie goes into your streaming system. And of course, that's going to hit box office, isn't it? Now, I think Marvel, uh, Disney, uh, Warner will all say, look, we weren't going to get anybody in the theater anyway. So this way, at least we got a little more revenue. Emma Stone is also going to do this, or at least considering it, uh, over Cruella. And I think this will be, won't be the last of them. I remember when Warner announced this, Warner Media said, yeah, because the theaters are almost empty, we're going to release it on HBO Max at the same time. I remember a number of people saying, that's going to be a problem because of your, you know, deals with these uh, stars. Disney says, there's no merit whatsoever to this filing. This lawsuit is especially sad and distressing <laughs> in its callous disregard. Oh, Lord, I, I'm not even going to read this. They're basically saying Ms. Johansson's just not taking into account the fact that people are dying in COVID-19. It's a contractual issue, and I, you know, I don't even know if, if, uh, if anybody even... It's not Scarlett Johansson. It's her agent. It's her lawyers. It's her people. Although her people told the Wall Street Journal this will cost more than cost her fifty million dollars. That's what she could have expected to make. But I think it might have been that's what you could have expected to make if there were no COVID nineteen and theaters were full. Are theaters full? I went to a Giants baseball game on Thursday. It was full. Maybe theaters are full. I don't know. I don't know. Dave on the line from Los Angeles. Hello, Dave. Leo. Oh, thank you. Hey, Leo. Good yes, sir. Morning. Good, good, good day to you, sir. Good day. What's up? <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Right off as a sideline, uh, your call screen or whatever. Love that old song. Don't call us, we'll call you. <laughs> and I got a thought that's early 70s when it wonders. A song right back at her. It's called Run, Run, Run by Jojo Gunn. Okay? All right. We're going to save that, and we'll play that tomorrow. Professor Laura, the musical director, is making a note of Run, Run, Run by Jojo Gunn. G-U-N-N. -N. 
Eastern. Oh, Eastern. I know who you're ta- I know who you're talking about. Okay. Now, my question, my concern is Amazon on um, uh, TV news. They said Amazon will no longer support internet access. For older Kindle tablets. It's not really Amazon. It's your phone company. So do you how which do you have a Kindle? How old is your Kindle? Oh uh, well, I bought it on sale right before the uh, Kindle Fire was uh, came out. So this is only the first couple of generations of the Kindle. You remember they had free internet, right? Uh, and that was going through the phone company's three G network. And that allowed you to download books without being connected to Wi-Fi or anything else. So if you have one of those older Kindles, it's not Amazon's fault. The phone companies are discontinuing their 3G towers. Well, that's, you know, that's why we got rid of analog TV. Same thing in a way. So it's not going to happen right away. It's, it's going to happen over the next year. Uh, it will affect Kindles sold as late as 2016, so it is possible you have that Kindle. The way to find out is to look in your settings and see if there's Wi-Fi on the yeah. settings. Yeah, well, you see, my what I do, my Kindle, it's, uh, I use it for my bedroom TV, okay? Um, my internet comes to my router. The router, the router and um, Kindle connects by Wi-Fi. Okay. By so a you're golden. As long as you still can get Wi-Fi, your Kindle will work. It will work with Wi-Fi. It just won't work when, if you take it out of the house, you go to the beach, and expect to download a new book. I don't care about that. <laughs> how, about my, how about all my Amazon content? All of that will be there just fine. So what this is really, and these things happen, what's, what's really happening is older devices which relied on 2G and 3G networks. I remember when Amazon came out with this Kindle, and I buy it, by the way, I bought them immediately. The, one of the selling points was free ac internet access forever. I thought, well, how are they going to do that? But they did it through the cell phone network. Those early ones didn't have Wi-Fi. But yeah. but yours does, and most current Kindles, all current Kindles, and most Kindles sold in the last few years, last eight years or something, have Wi-Fi. If you have Wi-Fi, don't worry about it. Yeah. If you have an older Kindle, the way you Amazon says, well, unfortunately, the wireless access has stopped working. You can still connect a USB cable and copy books over. Well, you see, the thing that worried me is that I bought... I bought this uh, Kindle kind of on a lark, and then about a month later, they came out with the Kindle Fire, and that was years ago, you yeah. know? Yeah. But uh, the thing works great, and I'll, you know, if it works, you know, uh, and if I'm satisfied, why change it? <laughs> well, the good news is it's going to still work. Actually, Amazon's been, I think Amazon's a little chagrined, and it's not their fault. Again, uh, <laughs> this is too bad because... Uh, you know, the phone companies have moved on. Remember, 3G was replaced by LTE, and LTE is being replaced by 5G. So this is older technology. They don't want to keep paying for that since... And by the way, this doesn't just affect Kindles. If you have an old phone that doesn't support LTE, or 4G sometimes they call it, you're going to experience this as well. At some point, those data towers are going to be turned off, and you won't be able to get 3G or 2G anymore. But Amazon... I think get some credit because they are going to, uh, for people with the Kindle first and second generation, the Kindle DX second generation, the Kindle keyboard third generation, you will get $75, $70 off a new Kindle plus $25 in ebook credits. If you have a Kindle Touch fourth generation, Kindle Paper, well, you should just go to Amazon site. I'm going to give you all the lists. But for people with newer Kindles that are going to have this problem, $50 off a new Kindle plus $15 in ebook credits. I like the Kindle so much, I keep buying the latest one. Uh, I have the Oasis now, which was really expensive. But boy, I, I, it's funny. I, I notice I don't, I'm not buying uh, books anymore. Paper, you know, dead tree material books. I buy them on ebooks. Uh, I still buy more books, perhaps, than ever before, but I I read them on my Kindle. So uh, I'm I'm still a fan of the Kindle, but those really old Kindles. All it means is that free internet you had 
that was really mostly used to download books is going away. And it's not the Amazon's fault, just just the uh, phone companies. And I even understand why they're when they're facing that out. I mean, this is the problem with technology. You know, it uh, it moves on, and devices that rely on a particular technology perhaps will no longer work, even though the device is perfectly good. That's what happened to my Sonos system. Right? I had all these internet connected speakers, and Sonos said, "Yeah, we're not going to support the older ones anymore." So. Get some new ones. That's exactly what Sonos said. Yeah, they work great if you don't care about using uh, any of the uh, any of the software. I have two Sonos apps. One for the old speakers, one for the new. The new speakers don't work with the old speakers, so I have two Sonos networks. No, it's, that it's it's not that the speaker stopped working, but the Sonos software on there is obsolete. Yeah. Okay. So here's the problem, user thirty six zero six. If that's your real name, I have new Sonos speakers and old Sonos speakers. To use the old Sonos speakers, I had to use the original Sonos software. The old speakers wouldn't talk to the new speakers. The new speakers had to use the new software. So essentially, you have two Sonos networks. So, you know, I did what Sonos wanted me to do is got rid of all the original Sonos gear. But I'm never buying another Sonos speaker ever again. <laughs> I can tell you that. It's a mistake to put the smarts in the speakers. The speakers are fine. But it's a mistake to put the smarts in the speakers. Separate. That's kind of my motto these days. Separate the, the technology from the durable good. It's like putting a web browser in a refrigerator. Well, don't you find it a pain in the butt to have the old and the new? I do. 8888 Ask Leo, the phone number. Pat on the line from Laguna Hills, California. Hi, Pat. Hi. Um, I have a question about a Chromebook. I have to buy a new one because it was due uh, uh, because it's, it's going to not be updated anymore. And I, I could use a new one anyway. I've had it for five years. And there's a lot of confusing stuff on here. And I thank you for taking my call. I've been trying for weeks. Oh, I'm glad you got in. So yeah. Yeah, confusing as far as which Chromebook to get? Uh, no, I I have one one now. So uh, and I have a Samsung, and it has. I don't need much storage. Uh, I don't put that much on it. Yeah, you're not has, you're not supposed to because that you know it's not it's not backed up. The idea right, of a Chromebook exactly. is to use Google Drive. Yeah, exactly. Right, and I'm a retired uh, real estate broker, and all I need to do is a contract every once in a while, and it does everything fine for me. Yeah. Um, so your Chromebook will continue to operate. Just to let you know, your Chromebook will continue to operate. What's going to happen? And it happens with all software and all operating systems at some oh, point. Oh, I know that. I've been doing my homework. Oh, you know it all. Uh, oh, good. Yeah, well, no, it's just not going to get security no. patches. So you're absolutely absolutely right especially if your chromebook's getting old it, it's a good time to get it google publishes um but my questions are about the um uh, uh i have uh, 16 gigabytes now ssd and now they're talking about emme -E -E -M, yeah yeah ssd is better so, exactly. So yeah. I should stick with that? Yeah, I would recommend taking a look at it. It really depends on how much you want to spend. You've got a Samsung. They're very good, and they continue to make Chromebooks. Uh, the best Chromebook out there right now is the Acer Spin. Um, Acer makes excellent Chromebooks. Um, oh, good yeah, so I'd take a look at those. They, uh, You're right. They sometimes have different kinds of storage. Speed of storage is less important on a Chromebook, again, because you don't really use the storage for anything except the operating system and the software. Oh, I would go with what I have now. I haven't even used SSD's it. SSD is good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. SSD is good. It's better than EMM. Uh, so what about the automatic update? Uh, so you can, when you buy a Chromebook, it will say... 
how long the Chromebook will last. Where I, does it say? I've been online trying to find <laughs> Well, don't buy one where they don't talk about their uh, update policy. I think, right. you know, I think actually it's up to Google. So let me, I think, and I think recently Google ex extended the Chrome OS um, life uh life cycle as i now remember I hear they're going for five or six years and yeah i don't mind buying one every couple of years yeah five years is a long time for um a chromebook to last you can look on the chromebook it'll tell you on the chromebook when it's gonna run out but i don't get the. If but I you don't get it yet so online, yeah so yeah. i would not buy one unless it says specifically <laughs> yes in their I specs would, how do i do that online well, it should be somewhere in the in the specs. Um, before you, to get it before you buy, um, Google has Google has now said. By the way, new hardware. Anything you buy today will get six and a half years of support. Right, I read that. So if you're happy with that, which I think it sounds like you are. But it's not any one you buy today. You could buy an old one that's due in a year. Yeah, you want to get a... Yes, that's right. You want to get a late model one. So... Um, How do I find that out? <laughs> if you go to uh, the Google page, support.google... It's a long page. Uh, let me see how you could find this easily. There's a page. Google lists all the brands and when their expiration date is. I found that. That's it. It doesn't say anything about a release date and uh, what the um, uh, automatic update expiration. Well, so so this page, which I will uh, I'll put in the show notes because I don't. It's so long. I don't think reading it out loud is going to help you much. It's support.google.com. But if you're on it, the what you should do is Google auto update policy, right? And in there, there's a list of every manufacturer. And every product by product number. So what you need is, okay, what am I going to buy? An Acer Spin 713, let's say. And you got to look at the product number. In this case, uh, CP713-2W. That should be on this page of the website or the, uh, the box or wherever you're looking at it. And then it says June 2028. Mm-hmm. So that's good. That's uh, that's the you know that's the full life cycle. If you're getting something that's oh. that's come that just came out, it's going to be six and a half years from then. That would be the full life cycle. That's okay, right. Not the okay. Can't be the release date. Uh, end of life. End of life is twenty twenty eight. That's what you want. Okay. So All that right. tells you it's going to get security patches and Chrome updates through that date. Great. And, and that's I what you want. From EMME is cheaper. Is it cheaper? Yes, yeah, uh, cheaper. It's not as good. SSD is better. Yeah. SSD. I will stay away from the other one. Uh, okay. That is my question. Thank you very, very much. I'm going out this <laughs> you're, weekend. You're very I'm welcome. Sure I'm not the only one. I am sure I'm not the only one. There's other people. I. I oh, you're not the only one. This is absolutely a, a completely legitimate question they don't make it easy and it's really frustrating that they in fact are are doing this sometimes like in a couple of years so i'm really glad that google extended this i think they they're starting to feel the pressure leo laporte the tech guy yeah emmc is a little slower I, it's not going to matter on a chromebook honestly um you know, but if you have the choice, get an SSD. He's been everywhere. He's traveling around the whole world, flying in jet aeroplanes, risking death for us. Johnny Jet. JohnnyJet.com. That's his website. His newsletters there is free. It's great. Many of them. Lots of good stuff. Hi, Johnny. Hello, Leo. Good to see you, traveling you man. Have you been well, anywhere since we no, talked? No, I actually about to say I... I've taken a little break because of the Delta variant. We yeah. had all these trips planned. Every uh -huh. week we were going somewhere. Yep. And I thought I was going to be surprising Me you every too. Saturday from a different destination. Yep. Canceled. But it's just, unfortunately, we had to cancel. It's just too risky for my Get unvaccinated your children. your vaccines, please, folks. Yeah, think about, please. That think way, about that the children. That way my kids can travel. Yeah. Um, please, folks. I, you so know, a, I know there's no problem. point in saying it because people have been so brainwashed at this point that they're not hearing... No, truth. I think I think they're starting to 
see upticks in certain places Good. and it's it's helping yeah we um, were planning a trip in september to missouri <laughs> i ain't going to missouri that, that's like the i ain't going to i ain't going to missouri right, <laughs> right. so um, uh you might want to consider you know the impact of uh, your your actions on others um, well you're going to see it because and they're going to have to do it sooner than later because there's a lot of places that we, I talked about it last week well, last week Italy and France are now uh, stating you have to have proof of covid uh, a negative covid test or vaccination um, to get into restaurants to museums to theaters and now Mexico just came out with with parts uh, the Cancun area hot spots same thing they're going to start requiring um, that was just came out this week also Broadway just announced this week that everyone uh, oh, over no. 12 have to, and and um, the oh, kids good. who are under 12 have to show a negative test oh, to, to get in to, and that's at least for the fall. But, and I've seen, I'm seeing, uh, you know, restaurants are now, um, some restaurants are saying you have to show proof of vaccination to get in. I'm wearing in. a mask I, now uh, anywhere uh, indoors, period. I, for sure. We I have opened too. our offices, but we, uh, we, all of our employees are vaccinated, so I feel relatively safe. Of course, there's breakthrough infections now, too, we got to be aware of. The, but, uh, yeah, so travel, which was starting to open up, I'm glad I went to Hawaii when I did. Yeah, I mean, we all flew to New York, and I brought my kids, and they were great. And we went to stores, stores that uh, didn't require masks. I wasn't wearing them. I felt great. But now I was like, that was stupid. Um I, I'm putting the mask back on, and, and here in Los Angeles County, you have to. But now they're just announced in Las Vegas, you have to wear masks. Uh, last week, it was just for workers. Now it's for customers as well, and, and in Reno as well. I think the whole state of Nevada. But you're going to start seeing this more and more. So, you know, the more people get vaccinated, I think um, the faster we'll get out of it. So let's hope it well, also. And then there's a whole world of people who can't get vaccinated because their countries are poor and don't have access to vaccines. And those are going to be breeding grounds for more variants. And so yeah. I don't know. I think this is going to be an endemic uh, problem. We just That's what blows my mind the most, by the way. We're trying to bribe people and pay them to get vaccinated when there's people who are literally dying to get it. Yeah. Uh, I just don't understand that yeah. part. But I do have some good news. Good. Uh, the UK opened up this week to Americans and the EU. You do not have to quarantine as long as you're fully vaccinated. You have to be fully vaccinated and you still have to do um, show a, a negative COVID test on arrival and then two days after you arrive. But at least Even you if you're vaccinated, quarantine. you have to get tested. You do. Interesting. Yeah, that's going to so. be probably the next thing, huh? That it won't be sufficient to show a vaccine. Well, I mean, they're doing that now. They've been doing that since January 31st in America. So anytime anyone comes to America, including returning Americans who are fully vaccinated, still need to provide wow. a COVID negative test wow. in the last 72 hours. But theirs is the antigen test. Uh, the UK is a PCR test, which is more expensive. And more... Uh Invasive. Yeah, obtrusive. I, I have not yet had a PCR test, and I'm I'm not sure I want to they, get one. They, listen, I had I, I've only had one test, and I had it once because I went to the doctor last May a year ago, and I thought I got COVID from it because I started feeling terrible. And they, I, he went, I went back, he stuck it up my nose. Hey, listen, it it bothers you for like a second. It's okay, really good, nothing. Good, it's really nothing. Good, honestly, good. It's uncomfortable for one second, but okay, I can handle uh, that. Some more good news. Uh, Delta this week extended elite status for all their frequent flyers, and they're also loosening basic economy restrictions. But I'm reading into this as it's not great news because they're now showing that they don't think business travel is coming back in the fall, which everyone thought they were. I did too. And now this week, like Google, Twitter, Facebook, New York Times have all announced that they're going to delay people going back to the office. And I've heard some of, from my insider friends who run big companies saying that people are not going to be traveling for business until they return to the office. And if they're not returning to the office in September, like everyone thought, there's definitely going to be a delay in business travel, unfortunately. That is true, isn't it? It is. And, you know, I did look at the TSA uh, checkpoint numbers today and, you know, they've been falling off the last two weeks. Bef uh, two weeks ago, they had the uh, highest pre-pandemic, but they've been falling off. But actually yesterday was 40,000 more people went through than a week ago. And I was surprised at that. So leisure travelers are still there. It's just the business travelers are not. And also the foreign travelers are not. Uh, once, you know, we get everything back in order, I think we'll see some huge numbers, but that's not going to be until 2022, I'm afraid. 
Oh, we got this close. <laughs> we did. I, I tasted it. It was so good to, to, to taste it and feel travel again. I felt liberated. It, it just so felt good to go to these places, close. especially with my kids. But um, unfortunately, I think we're just taking a little bit of a hit right now. But let's hope we can, um, you know, all just come together. It's, it's really, I mean, it, it. what you said to me last week really struck a chord and bothered me when you're talking about the passenger in front of you on your United flight home. I just couldn't believe that they said that, you know, I'm a certain, um, I'm a Republican party. and I'm not getting vaccinated was what just, she that, said. That blows my mind. Politics Honestly, have nothing to do with health. It doesn't. Uh, really or science. Doesn't. And um, so really... let's, let's keep politics out of this. This is uh, just about doing the right thing right. for your, but, not just for yourself, but for the people around you. And, and, you know, speaking of unruly passengers, this week also came out that one in five flight attendants have had physical altercations. Yeah, that's unruly, another thing. This, this, yeah. We're all cranky as heck. And half, over half of them are because of masks. Oh, I, I mean, get it. I, I mean, I please, it. just show up and put your mask on. It's not that <laughs> difficult. Is Wait, it? I don't want to wear, wear a mask. You wear pants, don't you? That's not I, an yeah. infringement on your liberties. <laughs> I, 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 it blows my mind. Just wear a mask. It's not that difficult. Um, so... And I really feel sorry for these flight attendants. Oh, I mean, gosh. It must be awful. Oh. You know, they don't get paid until the plane pushes back. You know, so if there's long delays or if they're fighting with passengers, they're not getting paid for they're that. They're doing that for free. Yes. Wow. So, you know, that's why I always... What about travel insurance? Uh, is Because uh, uh, can you get travel insurance in case of, uh, you know, COVID canceling your, your trip? You can. You have to read the fine prints. I mean, there's different kinds. The cancel for any reason is really expensive, and you have to buy it right after you purchase your, your, your travel. But um, there are... Now some of these travel companies are going to different ones. I would go to insuremytrip.com. They're kind of like the kayak of travel ah, where compare. I think they have 27 different companies where you can compare. And again, you have to read these fine prints. I don't like to read it. It takes time. Insure um, my trip. You know, for years I'd never insured my trips and it worked out okay. But uh, my travel agent said, oh, no, no, especially the expensive ones like the cruises. you got to get insurance. We went to Hawaii. We didn't have insurance. And it was a little nerve wracking. I've I've gotten used to the idea that, you know, if something goes wrong, I can recover some of my costs. So well, I was a brand ambassador for Allianz until this whole pandemic for five years, and I still believe in them. They do a great job. I believe in it now. I but, am. And yeah. they've have they have helped me. I mean, my son got sick on the road once, and uh, you know, I had a fifteen hundred dollar um, emergency room bill from New York City, and they paid it. Good. So Good. it it does help. Yeah, you might want to look at it if you are, if you do have to travel. And you might, I guess we're all going to look at maybe not doing that for a while. I wanted to go no, to Disneyland I, in I, September. Listen, if, you don't was, have, if you don't have kids and you're fully vaccinated, I, I would go. Okay. You know, yeah, Disney's now wear the masks. Re request, require all employees to, uh, to be vaccinated. So that's actually re a little reassuring. JohnnyJet.com. Follow him on Twitter, on Instagram, and of course here every week. Safe travels, Johnny. Thank you. Sigh. I'm, 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 missed I'm, I'm, it listen, by that much. <laughs> I, I, I would still feel comfortable tra traveling. I would just be more cautious. It's just I don't really have a reason. There's no business out there right. for no one's paying me to go anywhere. And it's right. like, do I really want to leave my wife and kids alone? And We decided not to do Missouri in September. I don't think we'll do Disneyland. We were thinking maybe Disneyland in December. We'll see in December. We are we're still on for Mexico, uh, end of October, and I'm hoping. I don't know. I'm just watching and waiting. Uh, and then, of course, we got in a year. We've got our Twit cruise uh, again, watching and waiting. I, just, I think that will, I think that will go a year really from do. now. I, I, I honestly, we'll I all really have our boosters by then. <laughs> You know what? They're talking about that. And, and again, so that's something that we should have talked about that, you know, everything is so fluid. Everything keeps changing because they're learning so much stuff and new variants are coming. People don't do well with that and they blame the CDC or they blame, sure. blame scientists. They're, first of all, the thing to understand is public health is a different discipline than science. Uh, and public health, because the goal is to keep people, the maximum number of people healthy, sometimes has to kind of gloss over the details. Because as you can see, if you're following the science, it's very confusing. I don't think the CDC has done a very good job, I have no, to they, say. I, no, they haven't, without a doubt. Yeah. And, um, and so some people capitalize on that for misinformation. But, you know, they should just say, we don't know. This is something new. And, is, and it's, things change. Mm -hmm. 
Um, they definitely need a better PR person uh, coming out of there. But one thing about vaccinations is that, you know, some of my Canadian friends and other people from around the world, they've either had mixed vaccinations or they had the AstraZeneca where some places will not accept it, especially if the AstraZeneca was made in India, I believe. Right. So it's a Sinovac or not Sinovac. That's the, um, can you, if you had AstraZeneca, COVID you could go back to your doctor and say, Hey, can I get an MRNA vir vaccine? And they would maybe do it. I believe so, but you'd obviously have to speak to your doctor, and I yeah. know ask it's just your doctor. <laughs> Leo Laporte, the tech guy, eighty-eight eighty-eight. Ask Leo the phone number. Last day of July. Can you believe how fast summer's going? Wow, wow. Let's go to. Uh, I think our next caller is from Huntington Beach, California, just up the road a piece from Johnny. Uh, Stan's on the line. Hi, Stan. Hi, Leo. Thank you for taking my call. My pleasure. Thanks have, for calling. I, I have a, um, a username at Verizon.net. Yeah. And I'm not able to log on. And, <laughs> this uh, is becoming a weekly call. <laughs> so it's a long and ugly saga. Uh, Verizon uh, started using Yahoo. And then, uh, of course, Yahoo got sold. I don't know who's providing email now with Verizon. Uh, have you called Verizon? Yeah, they, they I, I don't have an account with Verizon. I'm, I might buy. Well, where did you get Verizon.net email? Uh, when I first got email 15 or 20 years ago, I, I got an email account with Verizon, and I had Verizon. At ah. I've been with Verizon ever since, and I, that's my main email. I have a and, business. And, and do you pay for it? Uh, no, I don't. I I. My my uh, provider for my internet is is uh, Spectrum. And interesting. So it's interesting that you you kind of been grandfathered in. I think probably somebody at Verizon just audited the books and said, "Why do we have all these accounts left over?" <laughs> and just turned it off. They won't give you support, huh? You you can't no, call they them. Won't. Yeah. I called, I called, I've gone in person to the Verizon stores, and since I don't have a Verizon account, they don't they don't want to do anything to help me. And so my question is, what what is what is the workaround? Is it to go? <laughs> so Verizon used AOL, and then because they bought AOL, and then AOL flopped, and now and then and then they bought Yahoo, and Yahoo, they sold that off. So it's just such a mess. Um, and it's my guess that really you never should have had that account once you left Verizon, that that was a hangover account and that they probably have just disabled it. What, what, me what, what message do you get? Is it just say, I can't get mail from there? If I go on to, uh, if I do pop, uh, dot Verizon dot net and then try and log in with my password, it says, uh, it, the server uh, times out. It, it doesn't accept it. If yeah, I they turned that. They probably turned that server off. Um, <laughs> oh man, this is a this is a mess. Verizon has retired their email service. Okay. They would have sent you a notice. You can go to Verizon.com/support/residential/email. If you currently access your Verizon.net email through AOL, you need to go to mail.aol.com. If you use Yahoo, go to verizon.yahoo.com. If you have a Verizon.net email address, it says customers no longer have the option to keep their Verizon.net email address or extract their data to another service provider. <laughs> so were you migrated to AOL at any point? No. So all the emails that I got on my... Uh uh, right now on the in the inbox that I can't get to, uh, in, including things from doctors and things from uh, yeah, no, that's gone. And they say they they say they may they've been mailing you. No, they don't. They don't. They don't say anything of the kind. Also. Okay, so here's the one thing that might work for you, which is to go to mail.aol.com, mail.aol.com, and log in with your. Verizon net username and password. So your name at verizon.net and your password. Okay. If that works and it, it, it's supposed to, because supposedly they migrated you over there, I still wouldn't count on it working forever. So I would download everything you can 
and save it locally because uh, who knows if you'll be able to get in again. And now it's time to get a new email address. Okay. I think that something weird happened. <laughs> you were you were grandfathered in, and I'm sorry you kept using it because it was inevitable at some point that they would catch on and say, you know, email's not free or shouldn't be free. Uh, I think we have a mis mistaken notion that it's free because it's so often offered for free. But it's but remember who it's offered for, f and I'm putting free in air quotes, who it's offered for free by, people you're paying for cell phone service or internet service. It's it's really not free. It's bundled into that service. I'm of the strong opinion, you're going to, you started me on a rant, and I apologize, Stan, but I'm on the strong opinion that email is important to us. As you pointed out, you've got a lot of, there's important stuff in there. We need to treat it like, no, it's just some free thing. I got Gmail, man, it's fine, it's free. We got to treat it like it's as important as it is. And it's not expensive to go to an email provider and set up email with them. It's not expensive. Email is actually a fairly inexpensive thing to get. That's why so many companies offer it as a you know, benefit of being a subscriber. But I don't think you, anyone should use their carrier or their internet service provider as their email provider. It's, well, this is the, we get, this is the sixth week in a row I've gotten this call from people who are on Verizon or AOL or Yahoo. You, you can't rely on that. So I use a company, uh, and I can recommend it, but it's one of many called FastMail. There are many good email providers. You'll pay $10, $15, maybe a year. It's not super expensive. And I strongly recommend you go to somebody who's in the business of email and email alone. Uh, don't go to a domain registrar for your email either, frankly. Go to somebody whose business is email. They're more likely, the reason is they're more likely to provide you with a good service to stay in business and, by the way, to answer the phone when you call and help you because, hey, it's their business. So expecting free anything to be supported or work well, it's just you're taking a chance. And I think email is too important to take a chance with. I know a lot of people have Outlook.com, Gmail.com, Yahoo.com addresses because it's free. Okay, fine. But how would you feel if that email went away? We're relying on it more and more. It's really important. There's stuff in there that we want to keep. That's how people we know get in touch with us. It's how we get passwords sent to us if we forget them. I mean, this your email is pretty important. I think it's worth paying for it. Uh, Proton Mail. There are a lot of companies that have paid email services. Um, and I think it's worth paying for. You can continue with a Gmail account, I guess. Uh, but I would, uh, you know, I don't think Google's going to go out of business, but don't expect any support. And we've got calls from people who's, for some reason, their Google account's been disconnected and all their email's in there and they can't get it. I think it's better to go to somebody who does this for a living personally i really uh, feel pretty strongly about that um so i you know i i i'll put a link to this uh verizon support article in the show notes for you stan um it, it may well be that you've let this go too long and that it's gone you know this was something they they announced a few years ago when, when did this go up i feel like it was 2017 or something <laughs> no, 2018. May 13th, 2018. So, in a way, you got three extra years <laughs> of good times. Yeah. Try getting into it uh, through AOL. Um, if they converted you to Yahoo Mail, the same thing would be mail.yahoo.com using your Verizon.net account. And cross your fingers. And then there are a lot of email programs... Uh, just for as an example, Thunderbird that you could set up to work with it that would download all the mail. You know, have it download all the mail. Now you got a copy locally that you can access, and so you'll never lose that again. You know, back it up. But you'll, if you back it up, you'll never lose that again. It just depends where you go. Fast mail is more than that, yes. But fast mail is well worth it. Let's see what I pay for fast mail. I think I paid 90 bucks. Let me see. Fast mail. Billing and plan. 
So Fast Mail's basic plan is $80 for three years. So, um, and that's a pretty good plan. I'm on the professional plan, which is $230 for three years. So that's what, eight bucks a month. But I get a lot more with that. And I'm on that plan because I need uh, a lot of storage. But fast mail is fairly inexpensive. And it's worth it to me to pay $230 every three years. Less than 80 bucks a year. That's pretty good. And that's I would say fast mail is one of the best providers there is. Uh, Proton mail might be a little more expensive. I don't know. My luck. Um, I don't think... So if you if I compose an email to you in Proton Mail, and you're not on Proton Mail, it will either be unencrypted or you'll get a link saying, "Hey, you got to do you got to do this to read this." So most people do not, you know, that's not an effective email solution. If I want to use encrypted mail, I'll just use PGP. And it's then a prearranged thing between me and whoever I'm encrypting to. But the notion of encrypting email is nuts because most of the time email transits unencrypted. Otherwise, your <laughs> recipient won't be able to read it. So, I, you know, I have a ProtonMail account. I have a um, Tutanota account. They're fine. But it's nutty. The whole idea is nutty. It's end-to-end -end encryption if you are emailing somebody on ProtonMail or somebody who is, I mean, it's just nutty. It doesn't make sense. Email is public. <laughs> and if it's not, you should be responsible for securing it, not your email provider. Oh, encrypted in a place on the thing. Yeah, okay. But then as soon as you send it or receive it, it's unencrypted. And as we know, the three-letter agencies, they don't, <laughs> the way they get your emails, they watch it in transit. So I'm not too worried about it. I'm sure FastMail does everything to secure it, but who cares? If you're using email you and you want it to be private, you should encrypt it yourself. Arrange with the recipient to use PGP or some other solution and encrypt it. Or use Delta Chat, which is a very effective email-based encryption system. There's lots of ways to do it. You should not uh, put that burden on the email provider because that's not how email works. Yeah, if you want to, in fact, I have a, if you uh, get an email from me, you'll see a link to my, uh, I could show you my about. I have a big, long thing that I send a link to that is not only my bio, but for secure messages to me, do this, you know, email is, it should not be considered secure. It's just not designed to be secure, but there are good ways to use email as transit that is secure. So that's, that's my recommendation. I, I wouldn't spend extra money on Proton Mail or Tuta Nota or any of those. That's that's silly. Silly. It, I'm not saying they're not secure. I'm just saying that email is not inherently encrypted. If you want to send an email, if you want to send me email on Proton Mail, it will be unencrypted or I'll have to jump through hoops to read it. Oh, very happy, just me. I love my Maki. Sitting right there, you can see it over my shoulder, can't you? There it is. Lisa just, uh, I think Lisa's going to buy a um, Mini Cooper electric. Just 
put in an order for one. Well, hey, hey, hey. How are you today? Good to see you. Leo Laporte here. I'm your tech guy. Yes, we're talking computers and the internet and home theater and digital photography. We're talking smartphones, smartwatches, all that jazz. 8888-ASK-LEO is the phone number if you want to talk about the technology that's changing our world. 8888-ASK-LEO. Let's get right to the phones. You've all been very patient. Frank in San Diego, thanks for thanks for your patience. Leo Laporte here. Yeah, hi, Leo. Hey. Uh, my question is about my Dell laptop. <clears throat> it um, It has vertical color streaks uh -oh. when I turn it on, but then after it warms up, it um, it goes away. So Interesting. Yeah. So um, there are a couple of reasons that could happen. Some are expensive to fix, some are less expensive to fix. When mm -hmm. uh, a technical thing goes away after as you're using it, usually means that it, there's a hardware problem that the when that goes away when it gets warmed up and what happens when things get warmed up they expand um, so I'm gonna guess that there's a ribbon that's connecting the top of the screen to the bottom you know the screen itself to the bottom of the computer where all the all the brains live some very often in a laptop because you're opening it and closing it opening and closing it, that ribbon cable gets distressed it may be that that ribbon cable is just on the verge of failing but when it gets warmed up it ex expands just a little bit or something around it expands it pushes it together and all the ribbons reconnect that would by the way a bad ribbon cable would be the first thing i would suspect with streaks it's also possible that the and this would be more expensive that the video graphics subsystem has there's something called a cold solder most machines these days are a robot solder you're not going to get a cold solder but th this is an example of something that can change with heat it's a solder that's not a very good connection but when it warms up it works so it may be that there's a bad connection on the motherboard for the graphics card it seems unlikely uh that it's a software issue but there's a way to to test that uh, there's a diagnostic system built into the Dell that doesn't use Windows at all. So if there's a Windows software, a driver issue, for instance, this bypasses it completely and just uses the hardware to test. And Scooter X is saying the way to test this is to turn off your complete computer completely. I don't mean close the lid and put it to sleep. I mean press and hold the on-off switch till it's off, dead. You know, no yeah. lights on the keyboard or anything. Then hold D, hold down the D key and power it up. That'll launch a diagnostic, which will show some test screens. If those test screens also show that streaking, then it is definitely a hardware issue, not a, not a software issue. Got it. So that diagnostic is helpful. I suspect, I mean, it sounds like a, that definitely sounds like a hardware issue. Power supplies sometimes don't give a, a reliable power until they're warmed up, things like that. So all of those things, you know, it's hard to know exactly. My, my best guess, because we see it all the time, is that it's the uh, ribbon cable. That's a fairly inexpensive fix. You'd probably want Dell to do it or somebody who really knows what they're doing. But you, you can unscrew the, 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 you know, the lid and... Uh, and put and look at the ribbon cable and replace it. It's a cheap part to replace. I guess that's the most important thing. All right. Well, uh, I'll try the diagnostics first. Yeah, then, do that uh, first. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Yeah, it's always <laughs> nerve wracking. You know, when I if there were streaks on an LCD screen, often that just means somebody sat on it. But those would not go away. Those are da that's damage. So the fact that it goes away after a while. Uh, maybe that's that actually could be good news. It could mean that there's something else. Now, if 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 somebody sits on your screen or the screen's damaged or or maybe it's something that's intractable, it's often the case that uh, most laptops you can plug in an external monitor; it'll work fine. And you know, at that point, it's no longer a laptop; it's a CPU; it's a desktop, and you just use it with an external keyboard, mouse, and monitor, and now you got a little desktop there. So that's that's the other thing. Um, 
LCD TVs do this too, says uh, Kilotech in our chat room. And what is the cause of that on an LCD TV that it goes away after it gets warmed up? What is the uh, vertical yoke circuit? Okay. Vertical yoke circuit. Yikes. <laughs> I don't if you got a problem with your vertical yoke, I uh, I don't know what to do then. Uh, that's that's uh, that's outside my pay grade. Katie in Garden Grove, California. Hi Katie. Hi Leo. I talked to you last Sunday. Oh good. I Welcome back. Well, I don't know if you're going to say that. Uh oh, what happened? I'm I'm the one that's got the catch 22 with the Apple phone that I wanted to reset my password because it's not accepting my password. Yeah. They are asking for three IDs. And I said, go into the Apple store, talk to the genius. I did. And what I did the genius to... say? They're idiots. <laughs> well, I always thought genius was a little hyperbolic, but okay. Idiots, really? What? No they are no better at this than I am. <laughs> well, that's not good at all. Oh, I'm so no, sorry. So my thinking was that by showing up and showing your beautiful face to them, they would go, oh, yeah, of course that's you, Katie. Apologies. Let's unlock your account. Did that happen? No. Nope. nope. They're making me wait eight days now, so I won't even get a hold of this and I'm supposed to go on a cruise and the cruise wants me to have this on my phone. Yeah, that's how you unlock the doors and use all the features of the cruise these days. So yeah. I did give you an alternate, which is you could create a new Apple account and just use that. Okay. That, in other words, just give up and say, well, that account's lost to the ages. And remember what I told you, the only drawback to that is if, if you've got music, TV shows, books, or apps associated with that old account, you'll lose access to all of those and have to buy them again. I don't have anything that I had to buy. That's what I think you told me. So maybe this is the thing to do now is sign out. You go back to that same place we were talking about in the settings, your account, and you sign out. You say, that's not me. <laughs> and then... Uh, Actually, this might, let me think. The only problem with that, this is a phone you bought on Amazon, as I remember. It is. That is correct. Yeah. And was it brand new? No, it was refurbished because it, it only costs, it's 11, it's an 11 and it costs $750. Now my concern is, and I wonder that the dummy genius didn't tell you this. It may be, I wonder, huh. you've been able to use the phone though. I can use the phone. I just can't get into any new apps. Yeah, you can't install anything new. Celebrity is not happy about. Yeah, you know, you know, Celebrity wants you to use their app on the ship. They actually yeah. use that to keep track of you on the ship, too, by the way, where you're lo fine. located and they stuff. They want to go potty with me. That's okay. Yeah, yeah. They can find I don't blame them. They want to make sure you know, didn't fall overboard or something. Uh, uh, so I, I think you could go and sign out of that account and, and sign into a new account. And then all of the apps that you download, including that new celebrity app, will be associated with that account. Okay, but, it, but I'm worried about the think part <laughs> well it won't sync yeah you're, you're starting over okay so you have address information and so forth oh, oh sure I, yeah sure, I, well and you can't log into your apple account on the web either you can't go to icloud.com and log into it no no because uh, that's where you're i i think you're fine what you should do well this is interesting actually you're right i think the address book and the uh, calendar will be erased uh, because it's associated with that other account. What you really want to do is get that stuff exported, uh, and then put a new put in the new account. It'll it'll start with an empty address book, and then you could import the old address book in. So that's actually a very. I'm glad you raised that point because it isn't just the stuff you bought. It's also anything you're syncing. To that iCloud account, which is, of course, your phone book and your uh, and your and your calendar. Doesn't uh, Apple back all this up? It does, but it's 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 backed up, but it's under your account. You won't have access to it. 
There, but, this yeah, is all about yeah. somebody, and I'm a little worried that this phone. I don't know. I, this is an uh, the genius had no help for you. What did they say anything at all? They said, mm. <laughs> mm. <laughs> I don't think I can help you. Oh, that's You're ridiculous. Eight days. Oh. So now I'm up to next Tuesday. Because I went, I went, uh, I, I had my girlfriend make an appointment. She had to make it. Yeah, I remember you said that. Yeah. Um, so oh, this is so frustrating. Apple's trying to keep bad guys out of your account. Unfortunately, they're also keeping you out of your account. And you cannot because the, uh, I remember this from last week. I'm just filling everybody else in. I know you remember it too, Katie. You can't, uh, verify this old account because the credit card numbers you attach to it are long expired. You don't have access to them. So you cannot verify the account in the way Apple would like you to verify the account. That's correct because of, because this credit card had fraud on it back in yeah that's the red flag that they're now all concerned about so um, the other and the other thing is because you bought it from a third party you kind of got a gray market iPhone they may even care even less <laughs> I think that's probably what the genius the genius is, even, is doing even so even if I went in and brought a two thousand dollar phone from them, unless I can give them a good password and and any backup. Well, you can create a new account. You can export uh, your data. You know, sync it to Google, for instance. Then delete your iCloud. It'll delete that information, but Google will still have it. And then you can sync it back onto the phone. So you shouldn't lose any of this stuff. But putting a new account on there, I think that's the thing to do. Um, and, and then, cause you don't, there's nothing on that account you really need. Just start over with a different account, sign out of that account in your account settings on the phone. That's the only thing I could think of. I'm very disappointed that the genius let, let us down. The genius was a doofus. You went to the doofus bar and they got the doofus. You might try calling 1-800-MY-APPLE and just hoping you get a, a re customer rep who's more sympathetic. You like keep trying until you get somebody who's not a doofus. But I suspect that this issue is they're trying to protect the account holder and they can't verify that that's you. It's very frustrating. I just don't know any other way to do it, but just to get, you know, just start over with a different, different account. Um, and then celebrity will let you on the boat. <laughs> where's the crew? Where's the cruise going to? Uh, Greece. Oh, I've been on a crew. Where in Greece? Where do you start? That. Starting in Athens. Oh, you're gonna. I, I last the last cruise I took was Athens uh, to Dubai. Boy, that was fun. You're gonna see the islands. I love Dubai. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You're gonna but, have. But they changed it. We're no longer going to Israel. I was really excited. Yeah, going to yeah. Israel. We were going to Israel. We did. We went to Israel. It was amazing. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, you're going to miss that whole thing. At least you're going to get a vacation. Um, <laughs> just, I, I, I might be getting an Android. Get an Android. It'll work. You can get a cheap, you can get an Android for 200 bucks. Get them. You can get it tomorrow. You could just go down to the phone store. Who's your carrier? Uh, Spectrum. Oh, never mind. But that, that all they have is Android stuff. Oh, good. Yeah, but they don't. They don't have a store, or maybe they do. Oh, Spectrum has stores. Do they have phones in the stores? Because you could just go down and say, "Give me a phone." Yeah. Probably fifty bucks. <laughs> just use that on the ship. You know what? In a way, that's better because your privacy is preserved. Celebrity will <laughs> will not know who you are. <laughs> right, they won't find me at the Martini they, Bar. They'll never find you. You can stay there all night. <laughs> Oh, you're, that's going to, this time of year, you're going to have such a nice trip. Enjoy your trip. Yeah, thank and, you. And I think I would just log log out, start over with a new account. Next time, get the phone from Apple. They'll be much, much more helpful. They wouldn't be. They, 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 no, I understand. They but trust me, <laughs> they, know, they you already have a strike against you because you got an Amazon refurbished from somebody besides Apple. That's the kind. Of, oh. See, there are see the way these all these companies work. There are red flags that indicate fraud, 
and you have enough red flags on you that they're assuming fraud. But any one of them by themselves, you know, means nothing. But there's enough in there that they're going, no, no, we need a higher proof of identity. Gosh, you'd think you'd go into a store with your driver's license and that would be sufficient, but apparently not. Apparently that's not good enough for Apple. Apple's bigger than the government. We're Apple. We don't care. We don't have to. <sighs> Why are you rickrolling me? Why are you rickrolling me? I'll tell you why we're rickrolling you. This this little number, Rick Astley's 1987 hit, Never Gonna Give You Up. You remember that song? It was yeah, I don't know why, but somehow it became an internet sensation. It was a way of um punking people. You would uh, send them a link to something that would, you know, be something else. But instead, you'd get this song or the video of it, right? It's actually, I think it's a good song. The video was dorky, but it was 1987. So were we. We were all a little dorky back then. But somehow, this got to be a way of, of punking somebody. Oh, you got, and they called it being rickrolled. Well, so many people now have, have done that, that the video on YouTube for Never Gonna Give You Up has now surpassed one billion plays Rick, Rick Astley actually commented on YouTube on the video and said amazing crazy wonderful the world is a wonderful and beautiful place and I'm very lucky <laughs> I don't think Rick really understands why people use that video to punk people it wasn't, wasn't exactly because they loved it so much now one billion isn't you know that big a deal. There's songs with 7 billion views. Nevertheless, I think Rick's probably making a little money on it. It's certainly been good for his career. He was in the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade <laughs> singing it. Uh, the Padres uh, used it to troll the Red Sox. They, were gonna, they thought they were going to sing Sweet Caroline instead. <laughs> Never going to give you up. So uh, The Verge has done um, done a little article about this. Astley released a, a limited edition 7-inch blue vinyl pressings of the song to celebrate his billion plays. It's already sold out, so don't, uh, don't try to get it. I think Rick should be. I guess Rick probably should be grateful. I mean, he's, he's probably made quite a lot. What do you get? I mean, how much money is a billion plays on YouTube? You know, it might be a couple of bucks. And it certainly uh, kept him in the limelight. Never going to give you up. <laughs> uh, thank you for Rick rolling me. Professor Laura, our musical director. She's been great all day long. And I, I did not comment on the fact that uh, she played a ZZ Top uh, song. Uh, because as as she is wont to do to, to commemorate the passing of rock and roll legends, Dusty Hill... Uh, ZZ Top's uh, bassist passed away, and uh, and so uh, she played a, a little a little ditty for him. Eighty eight eighty eight. Ask Leo. That's my phone number. We will go back to the phones in just a little bit. Stay right here. Cute story. I didn't know this, but. Uh, Turns out that uh, the guys didn't have beards originally in ZZ Top, but after their first global tour, which was grueling apparently to, to help sell their first album, they decided to take a year and a half off. Uh, and both of them, without consulting the other, grew long beards. Long beards. Long beards. And then they got back together and they said, hey, you grew a beard. So did you. Maybe because uh, Dusty's brother's name was Frank Beard. Maybe that had something to do with it. I don't know. Beard was also in the group. Whew. 
Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888. Ask Leo Dan, uh, Don is on the line from Aurora, Colorado. Hello, Don. And how are you this afternoon, sir? I am very well. How are you, my friend? Yeah, if I was any better, I'd be twins. Oh, my goodness. Two yeah. of you. Could the world handle it? Oh, my. No, I don't think so. <laughs> I was a twin, but that's another story. So, anyway. So, uh, you know, I'm actually <clears throat> uh, calling about one of your sponsors, as a matter of fact. Although I want to I wanna give you a little bit of a, uh, a little bit of a heads up on who I am. I'm an accessibility evangelist. Nice. Uh, for Oracle. So, I actually do a lot of accessibility training um wonderful a lot of a lot of testing a lot of you know looking at code here's what you're not doing right here's what you're doing right um you know i work a lot with the different vendors software vendors and outside of oracle but i'm calling because i'm wondering if anybody has ever asked you or if you ever have tried to run iDrive from the keyboard no and i have to say one of the reasons i try not to weigh in on accessibility issues is because i could put on a blindfold but <laughs> but it wouldn't probably be anything like the actual experience so i rely on people like you don uh to well, to let me know and let companies know if they're doing the right thing i take it that you are not thrilled with iDrive's accessibility no, in fact, I'm probably going to have to remove it because I'm paying for it and it's not doing I am good. sorry. Don, do me a favor. I would love to hook you up with the folks at iDrive and maybe they would listen to you and do something about it. I think that would be the best outcome for all. Send, send me an email with your information. I'll pass it along to iDrive. Send it to leo at leoville.com. Oh, at leoville. Or you could go to techguylabs.com. It all comes in the yeah, same place. Yeah, I do that. You're yeah. that Sites fairly accessible. It's got a few issues. But yeah, we're not perfect. Know, I'll, I, I'll have to talk to you tech guys about that someday. Yeah, and I, I'm very aware of that. You know, I was disappointed because uh, I used to use something called Bobby that was a really great way to check oh, yeah. your site. That's gone, but I think there are other site checkers. Oh, yeah, there's a lot of free stuff. Modern there's websites like use so much JavaScript now. Oh uh, well, yeah, but there's 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 tools out there that will help. Absolutely, you and I think people need to do everything yeah. they can. So well, when you, know, you when you send me that email, I will also send that to our web devs. And and I will maybe you and I should have an off-air conversation someday. I could maybe uh, I have give you some interesting it, pointers. It would it would be uh, I'm sure uh, fascinating. I have nothing to do with the website these days. I, I of course I did when it first started, and I made sure it was accessible. We used a a wiki, and I made sure it was all text. And all accessible, but uh, it's that's been a long time since uh, any of my websites, except for my one uh, website that I run, Leo.fm. It's been a long time since I run any of those websites because the technology has really changed quite a bit. Um, Tech Eye Labs runs on Drupal. We had a Drupal firm design it, but send, wait, give me some points in uh, the note, and uh, and I will definitely uh, let them know, let the devs know. Maybe they can fix it. It's a pleasure talking to you, and same thing with iDrive. David on the line from West Hills, California. Hi, David. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi. Thank you for taking my call. This is very exciting. Oh, I'm excited too, David. <laughs> well, I, I've taken up a new hobby, which is astrophotography. Oh, and neat. I'm trying to learn Photoshop at the same time. Yeah, it's yeah. You know, actually, Photoshop will be very helpful. I think in your astrophotography. Yes, it would be. Uh, it is, and I have right now a, a couple PCs. And so a couple monitors I run, and even a laptop. So when I do, an, when I process an image, let's say on my main PC, then I check it on another PC or another monitor, or upload to Facebook, or look at it on my laptop. All the images are kind of inconsistent. Yeah. So, you know, in, it's because my PCs are not the they're not the latest and greatest, but they function and work good for me. Right. So I I want to upgrade um, and get a new PC, which would which would be mostly primarily now for geared for this, doing my Photoshop and producing a good image that what I see on my screen and I upload it to Facebook would be, you know, more consistent. It is uh, a challenge even for highly accomplished photographers because, as you point out, every monitor is a little different. And there's a big difference between uh, print reproduction and monitor reproduction. They're actually generating light and color in completely different ways. Print is reflective. Uh, computers, desktops, screens are emissive. 
And so the color is even generated differently. So this is a constant problem, color calibration. And you'll see, I think you probably have seen when you see ads for computers that are intended for photographers or artists, they'll often talk about the monitor, the monitor calibration, the, the gamut, which is the number of colors the monitor can reproduce. And there are some standard gamuts like Adobe RGB, which is probably the one that you would care the most about. And you want a monitor that can do every color in the Adobe RGB or sRGB gamut. There's also, you might hear about DCI P3. That's the one used for video yeah. and filmmaking. But even if a monitor is capable of reproducing those colors, it doesn't mean it's accurate. And so a very good monitor from a good company, Apple still makes one monitor. It's hugely expensive. Uh, what do they call it? Uh, I can't even remember. Something VX, True Display VX. That monitor is color, each one individually color calibrated at the factory. But even though Apple does that, a professional photographer, in order to get exactly what you're looking for, that consistency, is going to do it again and continue to do it on a regular basis. The Apple Pro Display XDR. Thank you. Which is, by the way, four thousand six hundred dollars. So that's that's a little pricey. So what you really want to do is look into monitor calibration, and that can be done fairly inexpensively. Apple started doing it for the Apple TV with the iPhone, and I wouldn't be surprised if at some point there'll be a monitor calibration tool that will use the cameras in a phone to to do color calibration. But right now, what you'll buy is a device that's designed to actually, it's got a camera in it, be attached to the screen and then use some special software and it will then let you calibrate it. So there are test images you could do and you could do it, you could eyeball it, but monitor calibration is the thing that's going to get you the best results. Even when you do all of that, you're going to see slight, if you, it depends how acute your you know, sensibilities are, you're going to see slight differences between each monitor. We have monitors you just can't make be accurate so um there are so i would suggest searching i'm looking at a link i'll put in the show notes from creative block with a q.com how to calibrate your monitor that's got a lot of information on it they do in fact uh have you know color slides that you can put up on the monitor but really the best thing to do is something like the spider s-p-y-d-e-r which is a a calibrator they call it a spectrophotometer that will let you calibrate your monitor. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. <laughs> Dick and I are bobbing our heads along. <laughs> Leo Laporte, the tech guy. It's time for Disco Dick D. Bartolo, Mad Magazine's maddest writer and our gizmo wizard hello dickie d how are you doing pal i am so well how are you i uh, i am good yeah. and i owe you a thank you oh you're welcome for what okay so last week i said leo i only have a hard wire wi-fi in my back apartment and i want wireless what do i do and you said well buy the uh, access point from TP-Link. Oh, yes. Leo, I bought that. Uh, and then I realized when I had it that my one hard wire in the back, if it goes into that, then I don't have hard wire. So I also bought a uh, TP-Link 5-port gigabit. Uh, switch. Little extent. Yeah, yeah, switch. yeah. yeah. Uh, hooked that into that. Hooked my uh, hard wire from the Disneyland into the... That and then into the access point. And how's that working? And it's where Leo, do you know how much a Wi-Fi extender it cost? How much? Twenty-five dollars. I know, they're cheap. Because it's not doing anything. <laughs> Just a little oh. radio. Well, it's doing something. Oh. Uh, okay. Well, I didn't even This uh, one looks really cool. I've never seen a tennis quite that big. That yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I splurged for that because for 18 bucks, yes. I, I could have got one with only two antennas. Oh, go for the three. Yes. And, and I thought, I need that. Now, it came with something I had no idea what it was. And then Chad told me what it was. A POE box. Oh, very important. 
got to have oh. a POE box. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Are you going to say what it is? Or? Power over Ethernet. I have power over an Ethernet in my uh, whole house. Uh, so all my switches, you don't plug them into the wall. They're getting power from the Ethernet. Of course, you have to have a switch that sends power over the Ethernet. But, yeah, that's a nice way. Then you don't have to plug it in. It just works. Yeah, and that's free in the box. That, it, come, that, it came with a POE injector? It, yes. That's for pretty sweet. For 25 bucks, yes. And the five gigabyte, the five port gigabyte... Uh, TP-Link is pretty inexpensive. But you know what's funny? Yeah. They're good They're good gear. I, I like them. I recommend them a lot. Yeah. So I, What's I that you the, got there? The uh, This is the POE device. Oh, that's the injector. Yes. Yeah. So you okay, plug so that into the wall, and then it puts power over your Ethernet, so you don't have to plug in some other device into the wall. Yeah. It, that is really great. So the three things, uh, and I just needed one Wi-Fi cable. I spent forty nine dollars. And, you're, and is it good? Is it working? You can... It's working great. Oh, I'm so it's happy. Working well. You yeah. know, what? I don't know what great is for wireless um, <laughs> because here, here in the studio, I have three hundred and fifty down nice. and twenty four up. Is that wired or Wi-Fi? That that's wired. Yeah. Okay. In the back, using this 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 TP device, I have sixty down. And 22 It's pretty bad, but you're oh, it happy. Is, it is pretty bad. Well, okay. wireless usually is about half, thereabouts, half the speed of wired because there's overhead. Okay. Might be a little bit more, 60%. Okay. You're not getting quite as much. But you know what? 60 is pl plenty, right? All I need it for is when I'm using my laptop in the back so you're happy. apartment and I want to yeah. watch maybe a, a YouTube video or yeah. something. That's no, plenty I'm for very, that. I'm very happy. Yeah. And, and I just wanted to thank you and say that. And, and it became it, it your gadget so of the week. Yeah. And, and the thing is, I never knew what you called that thing. <laughs> I kept I kept reading, take an old router. Yeah. And, you could do it with that too. Yeah. Yeah. But then it said, change the address. And, it's a little and I don't want to move. I yeah. don't want to move just yeah. to change my address. No, you don't want to move. No, that's good. In fact, there's a link to it on uh, Dick's website if you want to find out what he did and how he did it and what he. I can't believe it's in, that inexpensive. That's really great. That's a great price. All of that. That's because it's not doing any routing. It's really just a little radio receiver and transmitter. So it's good. That's what good. Even? Yeah. With three antennas, it looks good. It. I like the. Uh, my non techy friends. My non techy friends come in and go. Whoa! What is that with the three it looks lights? Looks cool. The yeah. This should play. Uh, nee, nee, nee. Uh, uh. Oh, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> that would be alien great. technology. Dick's that website has not only this, but everything he ever mentions on our shows. They're all there at uh, gizwiz.biz. G-I-Z-W-I-Z dot B-I-Z. Just click the big blue button that says the Gizwiz visits the tech guy, and you'll see all of that stuff there. But it's not the only thing on the website. Of course not. He does other shows. So when he appears on ABC's World News Now, you'll find links to the gadgets. He shows a lot more gadgets on that show. He's got more time, I guess. Or you move more quickly. <laughs> oh, no. What are you kidding? <laughs> ABC has gotten so ridiculous. You got two minutes for 40 gadgets. Hurry. Oh, yes. No, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Uh, there, there is no wider gap be than between podcasting I know. and network We're television. leisurely. We're leisurely. Yes. 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 You can talk about something. Even the radio is more leisurely. When I used to do live with Regis and Kelly, uh, Gelman would always say, I'm sure he used to do it before me. I'm sure he yeah. did the same thing to you. So bring a bring 100 devices. <laughs> Yes. Okay. And then the day before he'd go through them and go, no, no, no. Okay. No, no, no. And then the, and then he'd say, and make sure you put Regis's album on all of the pod iPods. Did he do that to yes. you? Yes. Yes. <laughs> I think uh, I think that was single handedly you and I accounted for ninety percent of the sales of Regis's yes, album. Absolutely. <laughs> and when I did the first back to school, my my segment producer called and said, Michael said, nothing too techy yeah. because Regis won't understand it. He doesn't. <laughs> the Didn't. night before the show, he said, HP has a new computer. Try to get one there by tomorrow. I said, you said don't use. They said, 
Well, Michael wants to see this computer in person. But this is Gelman, the executive producer. I, I imagine he's still at the show. He still is. Yeah, I know Marianne, our producer, is, is retired. But when Gelman, oh, okay. Gelman goes on and on and on. Regis has retired. Uh, in yes, more yes, ways than yeah. one. And and the big the big the retirement. big big retirement. But Kelly's still going strong. She was Kelly there? Or, no, you were with uh, no, with uh, Kathy Lee. Kathy Lee. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I got to work with Kelly. I think you did she's, both of Kelly them, right? Repeats. No, I never worked with uh, Kathy Lee, no. But oh, Regis okay. and Kelly. And then Regis announced he was going to retire on a show I was on, and everybody was flabbergasted. And uh, and I, I did a couple more with uh, his replacements, various replacements, but I, I missed Regis, so I stopped doing it. Yeah. But Here's the point the was they would ask for 100 gadgets, and then you'd show four because you'd only have a minute. <laughs> it was like yes, and then yes. and Kelman had a little a little sign, a little whiteboard <laughs> that he'd write "move on" on it, and then he'd tap it and go tap 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 <laughs> tap 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 move on tap 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 tap. That was fun. I loved doing that. Yeah, I really yeah. did. That was good. So was good. I don't think there's any a, a move on sign in the podcast. No. No, although occasionally we do need to move on, like now. But no, if you okay, go to gizwiz.biz, you can also play the what the heck is it game. No, we're not moving that fast. A uh, chance to identify a close-up of a gizmo or gadget and win an autographed copy of Mad Magazine. And, of course, Dick has lots of other stuff on the website. Dick's blog and log, Gizmos Ahoy for his boat gadgets, Gizwiz Garb Edge. And Mad Collectibles and Match Game Collectibles, too. There's lots of fun stuff on there. So, uh, gizwiz.biz. Dickie D, have a wonderful week. You too, buddy. See you next week. I'll be here. Oh, are you better. Who, who's going who's gonna to tell me the crappy gadget of the week? <laughs> <sighs> We've run out of time. I'm sad to say. Uh, thank you so much for joining me. I really should thank everybody involved and... You know, I don't do this all by myself. I've got a great studio crew, including John Slanina, our studio manager, Burke McQuinn, who fixes things back in the uh, at the home office. The famous Professor Laura, my musical director, answering the phones, our phone angel, Kim Schaffer. Thanks most of all to you for listening and calling in. I really appreciate it. I hope I'll see you next time. I'm Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Have a great geek week. Bye-bye. Well, that's it for the Tech Guy Show for today. Thank you so much for being here. And don't forget, TWIT, T-W-I-T. It stands for This Week at Tech, and you'll find it at twit.tv, including the podcasts for this show. We talk about Windows on Windows Weekly, Macintosh on Mac Break Weekly, iPads, iPhones, Apple Watches on iOS Today, Security on Security Now. I mean, I can go on and on and on. And, of course, the big show every Sunday afternoon, This Week in Tech. You'll find it all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next week with another great Tech Guys show. Thanks for joining me. I'll see you next time.